Stream title should be the same because I didn't stream anything else before this. Yep, correct. Okay. So, listen. Um, it's a very long book. So I what in my initial thought was to stream. Uh, stream and uh, uh, read according to the to my how many parts there are so there are three parts so previously I finished up part one like the entirety of part one even though it was only five chapters but it was really long it took me about five hours to go through um, uh, and then I wanted to do part two alone but the problem is part two is shorter than part three then part 3 is very short, and then part 4 is very short. So what I'm going to do today is to read part 2, the entirety of part 2, and then half of part 3. And then on, and then on the next reading, I'll finish up um, the book. So, 3 days reading. It's, it's long, but still not as long as Spring Snow or I Am A Cat. And I didn't enjoy Springs, no one I enjoy I Am A Cat. As everyone knows, because I keep talking about it. Anyway, uh, the end is somewhere around the realm of Final Fantasy XIV doing stuff, but uh, she's helping me out with uh, moderation and uh, party finder in game. Um, for that, I thank you, the end. So much. Thank you so much. Alright. Um, let's start without much babbling. I'm gonna take a sip of my tea and then we're gonna start reading part two of The Bird Giant by Kazuo Ishiguro. Of the Buried Giant by Kazuo Ishiguro. Part 2, Chapter 6. For all his tiredness, Axel was finding sleep elusive. The monks had provided them with a room on the upper story and well it was a relief not to have to not to have to contend with the, with the coal seeping up from the soil he had never slept easily above ground even when sheltering in barns or stables he had often climbed ladders to a restless night troubled by the ca cavernous space beneath him 
or perhaps his restlessness tonight had to do with the presence of the birds in the dark above. They were now largely silent, but every so often would come a small rustle or a beating of wings, and he would feel the urge to fling his arms over Beatrice's sleeping form to protect her from the foul feathers drifting down through the air. The birds had been there when they had first entered the chamber earlier in the day, and had he not felt even then something malevolent in the way these crow, these crows, blackbirds, wood pigeons looked down on them from the rafters? Or was it just that his memory had become coloured by subsequent events? Or perhaps the sleeplessness was on, an, on account of the, of the sounds, even now echoing across the monastery grounds of Wiston chopping firewood. The noise had not prevented Beatrice from sinking easily into sleep, and on the other side of the room, beyond the dark shape he knew to be the table on which they had earlier eaten, Edwin had settled to gentle snoring, but Wiston, as far as Axel knew, had not slept at all. The warrior had remained sitting over in the far corner waiting for the last monk to leave the courtyard below, then gone out into the night. And now, here he was again. And despite Father Jonas's warning, cutting more firewood. The monks had taken time to disperse after immer emerging from their meeting. Several times, Axel had come close to sleep only to be brought to the surface again by voices below. Sometimes, they were four or five, always lowered often filled with anger or fear. There had, no, there had been no voices now for some time, and yet as he drifted again towards slumber, Axel could not shake the feeling there were still monks below their window, not just a few, but dozens of rope figures standing silently under the moonlight listening to Winston's Whiston, blows resounding across the grounds. Earlier, with the afternoon sun filling the chamber, Axel had looked out of the window to see what appeared to be the entire community, more than 40 monks waiting in clusters all around the courtyard. There was a furtive mood among them, as if they were keen. Their words were not overheard even by those in their own ranks, and Axel could see hostile glances exchanged. Their habits were all the were all of the same brown cloth, cloth, sometimes missing a hood or sleeve. They seemed anxious to go into the large stone building opposite, but there had been a delay and their impatience was palpable. Axel had been gazing down on the courtyard for several moments when the noise made him lean further out of the window and look directly beneath him. He had been then the outer wall of the building its pale stone revealing yellow hues in the sun, and the staircase cut into rising from the ground towards him. Midway up the stairs was a monk. Axel could see the top of his head holding a tray laden with food and a jug of milk. The man was pausing to rebalance the tray, and Axel watched the maneuver with alarm, knowing how these steps were worn unevenly and that with no rail on on the outside, one had always to keep pressed to the, to the wall to be sure not to plunge down onto the hard cobbles. On top of it all, the monk now ascending appeared to have a limp, yet he kept coming slowly and steadily. Axel went to the door to relieve the man of the tray, but the monk, Father Brian, was, as they were soon to learn, he was called insisted on carrying it to, to the table himself, saying, You are our guest, so let me serve you as such. Winston and the boy had left by then, and perhaps the sound of their woodcutting was already ringing through the air, so it had been just he and Beatrice who had sat down side by side at the wooden table and devoured gratefully the bread, fruit, and milk. As they did so, Father Brian had chatted happily, sometimes dreamily, about past visitors to fish, the fish to be caught in the nearby streams, a stray dog that had leaved them until it staffed the previous winter, 
Sometimes Father Brian, an elderly but sprightly man, got up from the table and shuffled about the room, dragging his bad leg, talking all the while, every now and then going to the window to check on his colleague below. Meanwhile, above their heads, the birds had been crisscrossing the underside of the roof, their feathers occasionally drifting down to, to blemish the surface of the milk. Axel had been tempted to chase off these birds, but had refrained in case the monks regarded them as affection. It would regard them with affection. He was taken aback when the, he was taken aback then when rapid footsteps came up the stairs outside, and a large monk with a dark beard and flushed face burst into the into the room. Demons! Demons! He shouted, glaring up at the rafters. I'll see them soak in blood. The newcomer was carrying a straw bag, and he now reached into it, brought out a stone, and hurled it up at the birds. Demons! Foul demons! 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 As the first stone ricocheted down to the ground, he threw a second, then and then a third. The stone was landing away from the table, but Beatrice had covered her head. Her heading away from the table. Sorry. The stones were landing away from the table, but Beatrice had covered her head with both her arms, and Axel, rising, began to move towards the bearded man. But Father Brian had reached him first, and clutching both the man's arms, said, Brother Erasmus, I beg you, stop this and calm yourself. The birds by now were screeching and flying in all directions, and the bearded monk shouted over the commotion, I know them! I know them! Calm yourself, brother! Don't you stop me, father! They are agents of the devil! They may yet be agents of God, Erasmus. We don't know yet. I know them to be of the devil. Look at their eyes! How can they be God? Uh, they be of God and gaze at, uh, gaze at us with such eyes? Erasmus, calm yourself! We have guests present! At these words, the bearded monk became aware of Axel and Beatrice. He stared angrily at, angrily at them and then said to Father Brian, Why bring guests into the house at a time like this? Why do they come here? They are just good people traveling by, brother, and we are happy to give them hospitality as is ever our custom. Father Brian, you are a fool to tell strangers of our affairs. Look, they spy on us. They spy on no one, nor do they have in any interest in our problems. Having plenty of their own, I don't doubt. Suddenly, the bearded man drew up another stone and prepared to hold it, but Father Brian managed to prevent him. Go back down, Erasmus, and let go of this bag. Here, li leave it with me. It won't do carrying it everywhere the way you do. The bearded man shook off the other old monk shook off the older monk and clutched his sack jealously to his chest. Father Brian, following Erasmus's small victory, ushered him to the doorway and even the latter turned to glare again at the roof, pushed him gently out onto the stairway. Go back down, Erasmus. They miss you down there. Go back down and take care you don't fall. When the man had finally gone, Father Brian came back into, into the room, waving his hand at the feathers floating in the air. My apologies to you both. He is a good man, but this was a of life no longer suits him. Please be seated again and finish your meal in, in peace. And yet, Father, Beatrice said, the fellow may be right when he says that we intrude you on an uneasy time. We have no desire to increase your burdens here, and if you only let us quickly consult Father Jonas, whose wisdom's well known, will be on our way. Is there a word yet if we might see him? Father Brian shook his head. It's as I told you earlier, mistress. Jonas has been unwell, and the abbot has given strict orders. No one will disturb him other than the perm with other with other than with permission given by the abbot himself. Knowing of your desire to meet with Jonas and the pains you took to come here, I've been trying your since your arrival to attract the abbot's ear. Yet, as you see, 
You come at a busy time, and now there's a visitor of some importance arrived for the abbot, delaying our conference further. The abbot's even now gone back to his study to talk with the visitor while the rest of us wait for him. Beatrice had been standing at the window to watch the bearded monk's departure down the stone steps, and now pointed, saying, Good father, isn't that the abbot returning now? Axel, coming to her side, saw a gaunt figure striding authoric with authority into the center of the courtyard. The monks, breaking from their conversations, were now were all now moving towards him. Ah, yes, the abbot's return. Now finish your meal in peace, and regarding Jonas, be patient, for I fear I'll not be able to bring you to the to bring you the abbot's decision until after this conference is over. Yet I will not forget. I promise, and will petition well for you. It was surely the case that then, as now, the warriors' act blows had been ringing across the courtyard. In fact, Axel could distinctly recall asking himself as he watched the bunks filling into the building opposite if he was hearing one woodcutter or two. For one, for a second blow would follow so close behind the first, it was so hard to tell if it was a real sound or an echo. Thinking about it now lying in the dark, Axel was sure Edwin had been chopping alongside Winston, matching the warrior blow for blow. In all likelihood, the boy was already an expert woodcutter. Earlier that day, before they had come over to this monastery, he had astonished them by digging so rapidly with two flat stones he had happened to find nearby. Axel, by then, had ceased to dig, having been persuaded by the warrior to preserve his strength for the, for the climb to the monastery, so he had stood beside the oozing body of the soldier guarding it from the birds gathering in the branches, Winston, Axel recalled, had been using the dead man's sword to dig the grave, remarking that he was reluctant to blunt his own on such a task. Sir Gawain, however, had said, the soldier died honorably, no matter the schemes of his master, and the knight's sword is put to good use, give, giving him a grave. Both men, though, had paused to watch in wonder. The progress had been made by Edwin with his rudimentary tools. Then, as they resumed their work, Winston had said, I fear Sir Gawain, Lord Brandon's will not believe such a story. He'll believe it well enough, sir, Gawain had replied, continuing to dig. There's a coolness between us. But he has me for an honest fool without the wit to invent devious tales. I may tell them. How the soldiers spoke of bandits even as he bled to death in my arms. Some would think it a grave sin to tell such a lie, yet I know God will look mercifully on it. For I, for isn't it to stop further bloodshed? I'll make Brennus believe me, sir. Even so, you may remain in danger and have good reason to hurry home. I'll do without delay, Sir Gawain, as soon as my errands here finished. If my mare's foot isn't soon healed, I may even trade her for another, for that's a long ride to the, to the fence. Yet, I'll be sorry, for she's a rare horse. A rare one indeed! My horse, alas, no longer possess such agility, yet he, ca he has come to me in many an hour of need, as your mare came to you just now. A rare horse, and one you'll be sad to lose. Even so, speed is crucial. So be on your way, and never mind your errand. Horace and I will see to the she-dragon, so you have no cause to think further of her. In any case, now I have time to dwell on it. I see Lord Brennus can never succeed in recruiting Kyrick into his army. She's the most wild and untamable of creatures, and will as quickly spew fire on her own ranks as on Brennus's foes. The whole idea is outlined. The whole idea is outlandish, sir. Think no more of it and hurry home before your enemies corner you. Then, when Winston continued to dig without responding, Sir Gawain asked, Do I have your word on it, Master Winston? On what, Sir Gawain? That you think no more of the she-dragon and hurry home. You seem keen to hear me say so. I think not just your safety, sir but of those on whom Kyrick will turn, should you arouse her. And what of these companions who travel with you? 
It is true, the safety of these friends gives me no gives me concern. I'll go beside them as far as the monastery, for I can hardly leave them defenseless on these wild roads. Thereafter, it may be best we part. So, I, so after the monastery, you make your way home. I'll set off home when I am ready, Sir Knight. The smell rising from the dead man's inert had obliged Axel to take a few steps away, and when he did so, he found he had a better view of Sir Gawain. The knight was now waist deep in the ground, and the perspiration had drenched his forehead. So perhaps that was why his expression had lost its customary benevolence. He was regarding Winston with intensity, with intense hostility, while the latter, oblivious, carried on digging. Beatrice had been upset by the soldier's death. As the grave had grown deeper, she had walked slowly back to the great oak and seated herself again in its shade. Her head bowed. Her head bowed. Bowed. Axel had wanted to go and sit with her, but for the gathering crows would have done so. Now lying in the darkness, he too began to feel a sadness for the slain man. He remembered the soldier's courtesy towards them on the little bridge, and the gentle way he had spoken to Beatrice. Axel recalled, too, the precise way he had positioned his horse when first entering the clearing. Something in the way he had done so tugged on his memory at the time. And now, in the night stillness, Axel remembered the rise and fall of moorland, the brooding sky, and the flock of sheep coming through the heather. He had been on, horse, on horseback, and in front of him was mounted his companion, a man called Harvey, the smell of whose heavy body overpowered that of their horses. They had halted in the midst of windswept wilderness before, because they had spotted movements in the distance, and now... And once it was clear, it, it signified no threat. Axel had stretched his arms. They had been riding for a long time and watched the tail of Harvey's horse swinging from side to side as though to prevent the flies settling on, it, on its rear. Although his companion's face was hidden from him at that moment, the shape of Harvey's back, indeed his whole posture, announced his malevolence aroused by the sight of the approaching party. Gazing past Harvey, Axel could now make out the dark dots that were the sheep's faces, and now, moving among them, among them four men, one on a donkey, the others on foot. There appeared to be no dogs. The shepherds, Axel supposed, must long ago have, have spotted them, two riders clearly outlined against the sky. But if they had felt apprehension, there was no sign of it in their slow, relentless trudge forwards. There was, in any case, just the one long path across the moor, and Axel supposed the shepherd could avoid them only by turning back. <coughs> As the group came nearer, he could see that all four men, though far from old, were sickly and thin. The observation brought a sinking to his heart, for he knew the man's condition would only further provoke his companion's savage savagery. Axel waited until the party was almost within hailing distance, then nudged forward his horse, positioning it carefully to the side of Harvey, where he knew the shepherds and, the f mo and, the, and most of the flock were bound to pass. He made sure to keep his own horse on a nose behind to allow his companion the illusion of seniority. Yet Axel was now in a position that would shield the shepherds from any sudden assault Harvey might launch with his whip or with the club hooked, on, hooked to his saddle. All the while, the maneuver would have suggested on the surface a, camader a camaraderie, and in any case, Harvey did not possess subtlety of mind even to suspect its real purpose. Indeed, Axel recalled his companion nodding absently, absent-mindedly as he drew up before turning back to stare moodily across the moor. Axel had been especially anxious on behalf of the approaching, approaching shepherds because of something that had occurred a few days earlier in the Saxon village. It had been a sunny morning, and on that occasion, Axel had been as startled as any of the villagers. Without the warning, Harvey had healed his horse forward and started, started to rain down blows on the people, waiting to draw water from the well. 
had hardly used his whip or his club on that occasion. Axel had tried to recall this detail on the day on the moor. If Harvey chose to ex- assault the passing shepherds with his whip, the reach would be greater and require less leverage of, of the arm. He might even dare to swing it over the head of Axel's horse. If, however, he chose his club with Axel position as he now was, Harvey could would oblige to push his horse beyond Axel's and rotate partially before attacking such maneuver would appear to deliberate to deliver for too deliberate for his companion. Harvey was the type that liked his savagery to look impulsive and effortless. He could not remember now if his careful action had saved the shepherds. He had vague recollections of sheep and drifting innocently past them, but his memory of the shepherds themselves had, had become confusingly bound up with that attack on the villagers by the well. What had brought them of brought the pair of them to the village that morning, Axel remembered the cries of outrage, children crying, the looks of hatred and his own fury, not so much at Harvey himself but at those who had handicapped him with such a companion. Their mission, if accomplished, would surely be an achievement unique and new. One so supreme God himself would judge it as a moment when, a, when man came a, a step closer with him, to him. And yet, how could Axel hope to do anything tethered to such brood? The grey-haired soldier came back to his thoughts and the little half-gesture he had made on the bridge. As his stocky colleague had shouted and pulled on Wisden's hair, the grey-haired man had started to raise his arm, his fingers, almost in pointing gesture a reprimand, all but escaping his lips. Then he had let, him arm, let his arm fall. Axel understood exactly what the grey-haired man had experienced during those moments. The soldiers, the soldiers had then spoken with particular gentleness to Beatrice, and Axel had been grateful to him. He recalled Beatrice's expression as she had stood before the bridge, changing from grave and guarded to the softly smiling one so dear to him. The picture now seized his heart, and at the same time made him fearful. A stranger, a potentially dangerous one at, at that, had but to say a few kindly words at, and there she was, ready to thrust the world again. The thought troubled him and he felt the urge to run his hand gently over the shoulder now beside him. But has she not always been thus? Was it not part of what made her so precious to him? And has she not survived these many years with no great harm coming to her? Can't be Rosemary, sir," he remembered Beatrice saying to him, her voice tense with anxiety. He was crouching down, one knee pressed into the ground, for it was a fine day, and so it was a fine day, and the soil dry. Beatrice must have been standing behind him, for he could remember her shadow on the forest floor before he, c- before him, and as he patted the undergrowth with his hands, it can't be Rosemary, sir. Whoever saw rosemary with such yellow flowers on them? Then I have its name wrong, maiden, Axel said. But I know for certain it's a, it's a commonly seen and not one to bring you mischief. But are you really one who knows his plants, sir? My mother taught me everything grows wild in this country, yet what's before us now is strange to me. Then it's likely something foreign to these parts lately arrived. Why distress yourself so, maiden? Oh, I distress myself, sir, because it's likely this is a weed I brought up to fear. Why fear a weed except that it's poisonous, and then all's needed is not to touch it? Yet, there you are, reaching down with your hands and now getting me to do the same. Oh, it's not poisonous, sir, at least not in the way you mean. Yet, my mother once described closely a plant and warned that to see it in heather was bad luck for any young girl. What sort of bad luck, maiden? I am not bold enough to tell you, sir. But even as she said this, the young woman, for that was what Beatrice was that day, had crouched down beside him so that their elbows touched for a brief moment and smiled trustingly into his gaze. If 
if it's such bad luck to see it, Axel had said. What kindness it is to bring me from the road just to place my gaze on it. Oh, it's not bad luck for you, Sap. Only for the unmarried girls. There's an another plant entirely brings bad luck to men like yourself. You better tell me what the other one looks like so I may dread it as you do this one. You may be mock. Uh, you may enjoy mocking me, sir. Yet one day you'll take a tumble, and find a weed next to your nose. You see then if it's laughing mat if it's laughing matter or not. He could remember now, the feel of the heather as he had passed his hand through it, the wind in the branches above, and the presence of the young woman beside him. Could that? have been the first time they had conversed. Surely, they had at least known one another by sight. Surely, it was inconceivable even Beatrice would have, would have been so trusting of a total stranger. The wood-cutting noise, which had paused for a while, now started up again, and it, and it occurred to Axel the warrior might remain outside the entire night. Winston appeared calm and thoughtful, even in combat. Yet it was possible the tensions of the day and previous night had mounted on his nerves, and he needed to work them off in this way. Even so, his behavior was odd. Father Jonas had specifically warned against wood, further wood cutting, and yet here he was, back at it again, and with night well fallen. Earlier, when they first arrived, it had seemed a simple courtesy on the warrior's part, and at that point, as Axel had discovered, Winston had had his own reasons for cutting wood. The woodshed is well positioned, the warrior had explained. The boy and I were able to keep good watch on, on the comings and goings while we work. Even better, when we delivered the wood where it was needed, we roam at will to inspect the surrounding even if a few doors stayed, bar stayed, barred, to, stayed barred to us. The two of them had been talking up by the high monastery while overlooking the surrounding forest. The monks had long gone into their meeting by then, and a hush had fallen over the grounds. Several moments before, with Beatrice dozing in the chamber, chamber Axel had wandered out under the late afternoon sun and climbed, to, climbed, the, worn stun, climbed the worn stone steps to where Winston was looking down on the dense foliage below. Why go through such trouble, Master Wisdom? Axel had asked. Can, can it be you are suspicious of these good monks here? The warrior, a hand raised to, his sh to shield his eyes, said, when we, when we were climbing that path earlier, I wanted nothing but to curl in the corner adrift in my dreams. Yet, now we are here, I can't keep away the feeling this place holds dangers for us. It must be weariness makes you suspicious keen, Master Wisdom. What can trouble you here? Nothing yet I can point I can point to with conviction, but consider this. When I returned to the stables earlier to see all was well with the mare, I heard sounds coming from the walls be behind. I mean sir, the other stall was separated by a wall, but I could hear another horse beyond. Though no horse was there, when we first arrived and I let in the mare. Then when I walked to the other side I found there a stable door shut and a great lock hanging on it only a key would release. There may be many innocent explanations, Master Winston. The horse may be have may have been at pasture and lately brought in. I spoke to a monk on that very point and learned that they keep no horses here from a wish not to ease their burdens unduly. It would seem, since our own arrival, some other visitor has come and one anxious to keep his presence hidden. Now, now you mention it. Now, now you mention it, Master Winston. I recall Father Brian made mention of an important visitor arriving for the abbot and the great conference being delayed on account on his coming. We know nothing of what goes on here, and in all likelihood, none of it touches us. Winston nodded thoughtfully. Perhaps you are right, Master, Master Axel. 
a little sleep would calm my suspicions. Even so, I sent the boy to wander further this place, supposing he would be excused a natural curiosity more readily than a grown man. Not long ago, he returned to report that he had heard a groaning from those quarters over there. Winston turned and pointed, as, as of a man in pain, creeping indoors. After this sound, Master Edwin saw marks of blood, both old and fresh, outside the closed chamber. Curious, certainly. Sorry? Curious, certainly. Yet... There had been no mystery in the monk meeting some unfortunate accident, perhaps tripping on these very steps. I concede, sir. I have no hard reason to suppose anything amiss here. Perhaps it's a warrior's instinct making me wish my sword was in my belt and I was done pretending to be a farm boy. Or maybe my fears derive simply from what these walls whisper to me of days gone by. What can you mean, sir? Only that not long ago, this place was surely no monastery, but a hill fort, and one well made to fight off foes. You recall the exhausting road we climbed? How the path turned back and forth, as though eager to drain our strength. Look down there now, sir. Look down there now, sir. See the battlements running above those same paths. It's from there the defender the defenders. The defenders once showered their guests from above with arrows, rocks, boiling water. It would have been a great feat merely to reach the gate. <laughs> I can see it. it. It can't have been an easy climb. Further, Master Exo. I would wager this fort was one was once in the in Saxon's hands, for I can see about it many signs of my kin, perhaps invisible to you. Look here, <laughs> with them pointed down to a cobbled yard, yellow hem in the wall. I fancy just stood there. I fancy just there stood once a gate, much stronger than the first, yet hidden to invaders climbing the road. They saw only the first and strained to storm it, but the gate would have been what we Saxons called a water gate, after those barriers that control a river flow. Though this water gate would be let past, quite deliberately, a measured number of the enemy. Then the water gate would close on those following, now those isolated between the, the two gates, in that space just there, would find themselves outnumbered and once again attacked from the above. They would be slaughtered before the next group let through. You see how it works, sir. This is today a place of peace and prayer, yet you need not gaze so deep to find blood and terror. You read it well, Master Wisdom, and I shudder at what you show me. I would wager, too, there were Saxon families here, fled from far and wide seeking protection on this fort. Women, children, wounded, old and sick, see over there, the yard where the monks gathered earlier, all but the weakest would come out and stood there, and all the better to witness the invaders squeal like trap mice between those gates. That I cannot believe, sir. They would surely have hidden themselves below and prayed for deliverance. Only the most cowardly of them, most would have stood there, in that yard, or even come up here where we now stand, happy to risk a rope and risk an arrow or spear to enjoy the agonies below. Axel shook his head. Surely the sort of people you speak of would take no pleasure in bloodshed, even the enemy. On the contrary, sir, I speak of people at the end of the brutal road, having seen their children and kin mutilated and ravished. They reached this their sanctuary only after long torment, death chasing at their heels and now comes an invading army of overwhelming size. The fort may hold several days, perhaps even a week or two, but they know in the end they will face their own slaughter. They know the infants they circle in their arms will before long, will, will before long be bloodied toys kicked about these cobbles. They know because they have seen it already, 
where whence they fled. They had seen the enemy burn and cut, take turns to rape young girls even as they die like that they lie dying of, of their wounds. They know this is to come, so t and so must cherish the earlier days of their siege when the enemy first pay the price for what they will later do. In other words, Master Axel, it's vengeance to be re to be released in advance by those not able to take it in in proper place. That's why I say, sir, my Saxon cousins would have stood here to cheer and clap, and the more cruel the, dread, the death, the more merry they would have been. I won't believe it, sir. How is it possible to hate so deeply for deeds not yet done? The good people who once took shelter here would have kept alive their hopes to the end, and surely watched all suffering of friend and foe with pity and horror. You are much senior in years, Master Axel, but in matters of blood, it may be I am the elder and you are the youth. I have seen dark hatred as bottomless as the sea on the faces of old women and tender children and some days felt such hatred myself. I won't have it, sir. And besides, we talk of barbarous past hopefully gone forever. Our argument need never be put to the test, thank God. The warrior looked strangely at Axel. He appeared about to say something. then changed his mind. Then he turned to survey the stone buildings behind them saying, Wandering these grounds earlier, my arms heavy with firewood, I spotted at every turn fascinating traces of the past. <clears throat> the fact is, sir, even with the second gate breached, this fort would have held many more traps for the enemy some devilishly cunning. The monks here hardly know what they pass each day, but enough of this. While we share the quiet moment, let me ask your forgiveness, Master Axel, for the discomfort I caused you earlier. I refer to my questioning that good night about you. Think no more of it, sir. There's no offence. Even if you did surprise me and my wife also, you mistook me for another an easy error. I thank you for your understanding. I took you for one whose face I can never forget, even though I was a small boy when I saw it last. In the West Country then? That's right, sir. In the time before I was taken, the man I speak of was no warrior, yet wore a sword and rode a fine stallion. He often come to our village, and to us boys who knew only farmers and boatmen was a thing of wonder. Yes, I see how he might be. I recall we followed him all about the village, though always at a shy distance. Some days he would move with urgency, talking with the elders and calling a crowd together in the square. Other days he would wander at leisure, talking to one and all as if to pass the day. He knew little of our tongue, but our village being on the river, the boats coming and going, many spoke his language, so he never lacked of companions. He would sometimes turn to us with a smile, but we being young would scatter and hide. And was it in and was it in this village you learned our tongue so well? No, that came later when I was taken. Taken, Master Winston? I was taken from that village by soldiers and trained from a tender age to be warrior I am today. It was Britons took me, so I soon learned to speak and fight in their manner. It's long ago and things take strange shapes in the mind. When I first saw you today in that village, perhaps a trick of the morning light, I felt I was that boy again, shyly peeking at the great man with his flowing cloak, moving through our village like a lion amongst pigs and cows. I fancy it was a small corner of your smile, or something about your way of greeting a stranger, head bowed a little. Yet, now I see I was mistaken, since you could not have been that man. No more of this. How is your good wife, sir? Not exhausted, I hope. She has recovered her breath well, I thank you for asking. 
though I've told her to rest further just now, we are forced in any case to wait until the monks return from their meeting, and the abbot gives permission to visit the wise physician Jonas. A resolute lady, sir. I admired how she made her way here, giving no complaint. Ah, here's the boy, back again. See how he holds his injury, Master Winston. We must take him to, to the to fa we can we must take him also to Father Jonas. Winston seemed not to hear this. Leaving the wall, he went down to the little steps to meet Edwin, and for a few moments the two conferred in low voices, heads heads close to get together. The boy's manner was animated, and the warrior listened with a frown, nodding occasionally. As Axel came down to the steps the steps to their level, Winston said quietly, Master Edwin reports a curious discovery we may do well to see with our own eyes. Let's follow him and walk as we have no clear purpose in case the old monk there is left on purpose to spy on us. One moment please, I need to open the window. And also thank you Piao for dropping by. My apologies. I want to get. <laughs> I want to make coffee. When? All right. It's raining really heavily outside now. It's like super heavily.
indeed a solitary t- a solitary monk was su- was sweeping the courtyard indeed a solitary monk was sweeping the courtyard and as they came closer axel noticed he was mouthing words silently to himself lost in his world he barely glanced their way as edwin led them across the courtyard into the gap into the gap between two buildings they emerged where the, the thin grass covered an uneven sloping ground and a row of withered trees hardly taller than a man marked a path leading away from the monastery so as they followed edwin under the setting sky wisdom said softly i'm much taken by this boy master axel we may yet revise our plan to leave him at your son's village it would suit me well to keep him by me a while long a while for a while longer i am troubled to hear you say so sir why so he hardly longs for a life feeding pigs and digging this cold soil yet what will become of him at your sight once my mission is complete i'll take him back to the fence and what will you have him do there sir fight sea raiders all his days you frown sir but the boy has an unusual temperament he'll make a fine warrior but hush let's see what he has for us they had come to where three wooden shacks stood at the side of the lane in such a disrepair that each appeared to be held out by its neighbor the wet ground was rutted with wheel tracks and edwin paused to point this out then he led them into the furthest of the three shacks there was no door and much of the roof was open to the sky as they came in several birds flew off in furious commotion and axel saw in a gloomy space vacated a crudely made cart perhaps the works of the monks themselves its two wheels sunk into the mud what arrested the attention sorry what arrested the attention was a large cage mounted on its carriage and coming closer axel noticed that through the cage was itself iron a thick woolen wooden pe- pillar ran down its spine fixing it firmly to the boards underneath this same post was festooned with chains and ba- manacles and at, at and at head heights what appeared to be a blackened iron mask though with no holes for the eyes and only one small mouth and only a small one for the mouth the cart and the area all around it was covered with feathers and droppings edwin pulled open the cage door and proceeded to move it back and forth on its squeaking hinge he was again speaking excited words to which wisdom throwing searching glances around the shed returned the occasional nod it's curious axel said this monks should have need it's curious Axel said, "This monks should have need of such an object to di- as this, no doubt to aid some pious ritual." The warrior started to move around the cart, stepping carefully to avoid the stagnant mud- puddles. "I saw something like this once before," he said. "You may suppose this device, this device intended to expose the man within it to the cruelty of the elements. Yet look." See how these bars stand far enough apart to allow my shoulders to pass through, and here, look how these feathers stick to the iron in hardened blood. A man fastened here is offered thus to the mountain birds. Caught in these cuffs, he has no way to fight off the hungry beaks. This iron mask, though it may look frightful, is in fact a thing of mercy, for with it, the eyes. At least aren't feasted on. There may yet be some more gentle purpose, Axel said, but Edwin had started to talk again, and Winston turned and looked out of the shed. The boy says he followed these tracks out to a spot nearby, on the cliff's edge. Said the warrior eventually. He says the grounds well rutted there, showing where this wagon had often stayed. In other words. The signs all support my guess, and I can see too this cart's been wheeled out just lately. I don't know what it means, Master Winston, 
but I admit, and now begin to share your uneasiness. This object sends chills through me and makes me want to return to my wife's side. It's as well as we do, sir. Let's not stay any longer. But as they came out of the shack, Edwin, who again was leading, stopped abruptly, looking past him into the evening gloom. Axel could see a roped figure in the tall grass a short distance from them. I would say it's the monk lately sweeping the yard, the warrior said to Axel. Does he see us? I would say he sees us and knows we see him, yet he stands there still as a tree. Well, let's go to him. The monk was standing at a spot to the side of their path, the grass up to his knee. As they approached, the man remained quite still, though the wind pulled at his rope and long white hair. He was thin, almost emaciated, and his protruding eyes stared at him, stared at them without expression. You observed us, sir, Winston said, stopping, and you know what we have just discovered, so perhaps... You will tell us the purpose to which you monks put that device. Saying nothing, the monk pointed towards the monastery. It may be he is vowed to silence, Axel said, or else as mute as you lately pretended, Master Wiston. The monk came out of the grass and onto the path, his strange eyes fixed each of them in turn. Then he pointed again towards the monastery and set off. He followed they followed him just a short distance behind the monk continually glancing back at them over his shoulder the monastery the monastery buildings were now in dark shapes were now dark shapes against the setting sky as they drew closer the monk paused moved his forefinger over his lips then continued at a more cautious pace he, shim he seemed anxious, they remained unseen, and to avoid the central courtyard, he took them down narrow passageways behind the buildings where the earth was pitted and sloped severely. Once, as they went with heads bowed along the wall, there came from the very windows above sounds from the monks' conference. One voice was shouting over hub hub, then a second voice perhaps that of the abbot called for order, but there was no time to, lo to loiter, and soon they were gathered at an archway through which could be seen the main courtyard. The monk now indicated with, ur with urgent signs that they were to proceed as quickly and quietly as possible. As it was, they were not obliged to cross the courtyard where the torches were now burning but only the only to skirt one corner under the under the shadows of colonnade when the monk halted again axel whispered to him good sir since your intention must to take us somewhere i would ask you to let me go fetch my wife for i am uneasy leaving her alone the monk who had turned immediately to fix axel in a stare shook his head and pointed to the demi set to the demi to the semi-dark. Only then did Axel spot Beatrice standing in the doorway further down the, clo the cloister. Relieved, he gave the wave, and as the party moved towards her, there came be from behind them a surge of angry voices from the monks' meeting. How is it with you, princess? he asked, reaching to take her outstretched hand. Peacefully taking my rest, Axel, when this silent monk appeared before me the way I took him for a phantom. But he is keen to lead us somewhere and will best follow. The monk repeated his gesture for silence, then beckoning, pushed past Beatrice across the threshold where he had where she had been waiting. The corridors now became as tunnel-like as those of their, their warren at home, and the lamps flickering in the little alcoves hardly dispelled the darkness. Axel, with Beatrice holding his arm, kept the hand held out before him. For a moment, they were back in the open air, crossing a muddy yard between plowed allotments, then into another low stone building. Here, the corridor was wider and lit by, large, by larger flames, and then the monk seemed... Finally, 
seemed finally to relax. Recovering his breath, he looked them over once more, then signaling for them to wait, vanished under an arc. After a little frame, the monk appeared again and ushered them forward. As he did so, a frail voice from within said, Come again, come in, guest. A poor chamber this to receive you, but you are welcome. One sip of coffee. As he waited for sleep to come to him, Axel recalled once again how the four of them together with the silent monk had squeezed into the tiny cell a candle was burning next to the bed, and he had felt Beatrice recoiled as she caught sight of the figure lying in it. Then she had taken a breath and moved further into the room. There was a large there was hardly space for them all, but they had before long arranged themselves around the bed, the warrior and the boy in the corner furthest away. Axel's back was pressed against the chilly stone wall, but Beatrice, standing just in front and leaning into him as if for reassurance, was almost up to the sick bed. There was a faint smell of vomit and urine. The silent monk, meanwhile, was fussing about the man in bed, helping to raise him to a sitting position. Their, their, hoist, their host sorry, their host was white-haired and advanced in years. His frame was large and until recently must have been a vigorous, but now the simple act of sitting up appeared to cause multiple agonies. A coarse blanket fr fell f from around him as he raised himself, reeling a nightshirt patch with blood stains. But what had caused Beatrice to shrink back was the man's neck and face, starkly illuminated by the bedside candle, the, sw the, swollen, the swollen mound under one side of the chin, a deep purple fading to a yellow, obliged the head to be held in such in slight angle. The peak of the mound was split and caked with pus and bl old blood. On the face itself, a gouge ran from just below the cheek bone down to the jaw, exposing a section of the man's inner mouth and gum. It must have caused him greatly to smile, but once he was settled in his new position, the monk did justice. Welcome, welcome. I am Jonas, whom I know you came a long way to see. My dear guest, don't look at me with such pity. These wounds are no longer new and hardly bring the pain they once did. We see now, Father Jonas. Beatrice said. Why your good abbot so reluctant to have strangers impose on you? We'd have waited for his permission, but this kind of monk led us to you. Ninian here is my most trusted friend, and, it, and even if he's vowed to silence, we understand one another perfectly. He's watched each of your, with each of you since your arrival and brought me frequent reports. I thought it time we met even if the abbot knows nothing of it. But what can have caused you such injuries, father? Beatrice asked. And you a man famed for kindness and wisdom. Let's leave the topic, mistress. My feeble strength won't allow me to speak for long. I know two of you here, yourself and this brave boy, seek my advice. Let me see the boy first, and I understand he carries, a w whom I understand carries a wound. Come closer into the light, dear lad. The monk's voice, though soft, possessed a natural command, and Edwin started to move towards him, but immediately Winston reached forward and gripped the boy by the arm. Perhaps it was the effect of the f candle flame. Or the warrior's trembling shadow cast on the wall behind him, but it seemed to Axel for that for an instant, Winston's eyes were fixed on the un on the un on the injured monk with peculiar intensity, even hatred. The warrior drew the boy back to the wall, then took a step further himself, as though to shield his charge. What's wrong, Shepherd? Asked the, asked Father Jonas. Do you fear my f Do you fear poison from my wounds will travel to your brother? Then my hand need not touch him. 
let him step closer, and my eyes alone will test his injury. The boy's wound is clean, Winston said. It's just this good woman now seeks your help. Master Winston, Beatrice said, how can you say such a thing? You must know how well a wound clean. One moment turned fe fevered the next. The boy must seek this wise monk's guidance. Winston seemed not to hear Beatrice and continued to stare at the monk. Father Jonas, in turn, regarded the warrior as though he were, he were a thing of great fascination. After a while, Father Jonas said, You stand with remarkable boldness for a humble shepherd. It must be the habit of my trade. A shepherd must stand long hours, watchful of wolves gathering in the dark. No doubt that's so, I imagine too. How a shepherd must judge quickly, hearing a sound in the dark, if it heralds danger or approach of a friend, must much must rest on the ability to make such decisions quickly and well. Only a foolish shepherd her hears a snapping twig or spots a dark shape in, in the dark and assumes a companion come to relieve him. We are cautious. We are a cautious breed. And what's more, sir, I have just now seen with my own eyes the device in your barn. Ah, uh, I thought you would come upon it sooner or later. What do you make of your discovery, Shepherd? It angers me. Angers you? Father Jonas wraps this with some force, as though himself suddenly angered. Why does it anger you? Tell me if I'm wrong, sir. My surmise is that... The custom here has been for the monks to take turns in the cage, exposing their bodies to the wild birds, hoping this way to atone for crimes once committed in this country and long unpunished. Even these ugly wounds I see here before me have gained, have gained in this way. And for all I know, I know, and for all I know, a sense of piety eases your suffering. Yet, let me say, I feel no pity to you. See your gashes. How can you describe as penance, sir, the drawing of a veil over the foulest deeds? Is your Christian God one to bribe so easily with self-inflicted pain and a few prayers? Does he care so little for justice left undone? Our God is a God of mercy, shepherd, whom you, a pagan, may find hard to comprehend. It's no foolishness to seek forgiveness from such a God However great the, car the crime, our God's mercy is boundless. What use is a God with boundless mercy, sir? You mock me as a pagan, yet the gods of my ancestors pronounce clearly their ways and punish severely when we break their laws. Your Christian God of mercy gives men license to pursue their greed, their lust for land and blood, knowing a few prayers and a little penance will bring forgiveness and blessing. It's true, Shepherd, that here in the monastery there are those who still believe such things, but let me assure you, Ninian and I have long let go such delusions and neither are we alone. We know our God's mercy is not to be abused, yet many of my brother's monks, the abbot included, will not accept this. They still believe that cage, and our constant prayers will be enough. Yet these dark crows and ravens are a sign of God's anger. They never came before. Even last winter, though the wind made the strongest of us weep, the birds were but mischievous children, their beaks bringing only small suffering. A shake of the chains or a shout was enough to keep them at bay. But now, a new breed comes to find us, larger, bolder, and with fury in their eyes. They tear at us in calm, no, no matter how we struggle or cry out. We have lost three dear friends in these past months, and many more of us carry deep wounds. These surely are signs. Winston's manner had been softening, but he had kept himself firmly in front of the boy. Are you saying, he asked, I have friends in this monastery? Winston's in this room, shepherd. Yes, 
elsewhere we remain divided even now they argue in great passion about how we are to continue the abbot will insist we carry on as always others of our view will say it's time to stop that no forgiveness awaits us in the end of this path that we must uncover what had been hidden and faced the past but still but those voices i fear remain few and will not carry the day shepherd will you trust me now to see this boy's wound for a moment wisdom remained still then he moved aside signaling to edwin to step forward immediately the silent monk helped father jonas to a more upright position both monks had become suddenly quite animated then grasping the candle holder from the beside from the bedside tuck edwin closer impatiently raising the boy's shirt for father jonas to see then for what seemed like a long time both monks went on looking at the boy's wound ninian moving the light one way to the other as though it was a pool within which a miniature world was contained eventually the monks exchanged what seemed to excel looks of triumph but the very next moment father jonas fell shaking back onto his pillow with an expression closer to res resignation or else sadness as ninian ha hastily put down the candle to attend to him edwin slipped back into the shadows to stand beside wisdom father jonas beatrice said now you have seen the boy's wound tell us if it's clean and it will heal on its own on its own father jonas's eyes were closed and he was still breathing heavily but he said quite calmly i believe it will heal if he takes good care father ninian will, pre will prepare an ointment for him before he leaves this place father beatrice went on your present conversation with master wiston isn't entirely within my understanding yet it greatly interests me is that is that so mistress father jonas still recovering his breath opening his eyes and looked at her last night in a village below beatrice said i spoke with a woman wise with medicine she had much to tell about my sickness but when i asked her about this mist the same that make us forget the last hour as readily as meant as as morning many years past she confessed that she had no idea what or whose work it was yet she said if there was one wise enough to know it would be you father jonas up here in the monastery so my husband and i made our way here even though it's a harder road to our son's village where we are impatiently awaited it was my hope that you would tell us something of this mist and how axel and i might be free of it it may be i am a foolish woman and it seemed to me just now for all the talk of shepherds you and master wiston were speaking of the same mist and much bothered by what's been lost of our past so let me ask this of you and master wiston too do both of you know what causes this mist to, po to fall upon us father jonas and wiston Exchange looks, then Winston said quietly, It's the dragon Curic, Mrs. Beatrice, that roams these peaks, and she's the cause of the mist that you speak of. Yet these monks are here to protect her, and have yet have, and have done so for years. I'll wager even now, if they are wise to my identity, they will s have sent for men to destroy me. Father Jonas, can this be true? Beatrice asked. The mist is the work of this she-dragon. The monk, who was for an instant had seemed far away, turned to Beatrice. The shepherd tells the truth, mistress. It's Kirik's breath that fills this land and robs us of memories. Axel, do you hear that? The she-dragons is the cause of the mist. If Master Wiston or anyone else, even that old knight met on the road, can slay the creature, our memories will be restored to us. Axel, why so quiet? Okay. And 
Indeed, Axel had been so lost in thought, and although he had heard his wife's word, wife's wife's words, and noticed her excitement, it was all he could do simply to reach out a hand to her. Before he could find any words, Father Jonas said to Winston, "Shepherd, if you know your danger, why do you dally here? Why not take this boy and be on your way? The boy needs rest. I do." But you don't rest, Shepherd. You cut firewood and wander like hungry wolves. When we arrived, your log pile was low, and the nights are cold in these mountains. There's something else puzzled me, Shepherd. Why does Lord Brennus hunt you as he does? For many days now, his soldiers have searched the country for you. Even last year, when a ma- when another man came from the east to hunt Kirik. Brennan's believed it might be you and sent men out to search you. They came up here asking for you, Shepherd. Who are you to Brennan's? We knew one another as young lads even before the age of this boy here. You have come to this country on an errand, Shepherd. Why jeopardize it to settle old scores? I say to you, take this boy and be on your way even before the monks come out of their meeting. If Lord Brennan's does me the courtesy to come here after the If Lord Brennan's does me the courtesy to come here after me this night, I am obliged then to stand and face him. Master Whiston, Beatrice said, I don't know what's between you and Lord Brennan's, but if it's your mission to slay the great dragon Curic, I beg you don't be distracted from it. There will be time to settle scores later. The mistress is right, Shepherd. I fear I know too the purpose of all this wood cutting. Listen to what we say, sir. This boy gives you a unique chance, the like of which may not come to your way again. Take him and be on your way. Wisdom. Look thoughtfully at Father Jonas. <clears throat> then bowed his head politely. I'm happy to have met you, Father, and I apologize if earlier I addressed you this, this, this courteously. But now, let me and this boy take our, our leave of you. I know Mistress Beatrice still wishes for advice, and she's brave and, and she's a brave and good woman. I beg you, preserve some strength to attend to her. Now, I'll thank you for your counsel and bid you farewell. Lying in the dark. Still hopeful sleep would overtake him, Axel tried to remember why he had been so oddly silent so much of his time in Father Jonas's cell. There had been some reason, and even Beatrice, triumphant to discover the origin of his mist, had turned to him and exclaimed he had been able to only reach out his hand to her, still not speaking. He had been in the throes of some powerful and strange emotion, one that had all but put him in a dream, though every word being spoken around him still reached his ears with perfect clarity. He had felt as one standing in a boat on a wintry river, looking out into the dense fog, knowing it would, at any moment, part to reveal vivid glimpse of the land ahead. And he had caught and he had been caught in a kind of ad terror, yet at, the, yet at the same time had felt a curiosity or something stronger and darker, and he told himself firmly, Whatever it may be, let me see it, let me see it. One sip of coffee. Had he actually spoken these words out loud? Perhaps he has done so. Sorry. Perhaps he had done so, and just at the instant, Beatrice had turned to him in excitement, exclaiming, Axel, do you hear that? The she dragons, the cause of the mist. He could not remember what had. What had happened once Winston and the boy had departed Father Jonas's chamber? The silent Magnanian must have left with them. 
probably to provide some the ointment for the boy's wound, or simply to lead them back unobserved. In any case, he and Beatrice have been left alone with Father Jonas, and the latter, despite his wounds and exhaustion, had examined his wife thoroughly. The monk had not asked her to remove clothing. Axel had been relieved, and though here, too, his recollection was hazy, an image came to him of Jonas pressing an ear to Beatrice's side, eyes closed in concentration as though some faint message might be heard coming from within. Axel remembered, too, the monk, with, with, eyes blink, with blinking eyes, putting to Beatrice a series of questions. Did she feel sick after drinking water? Did she ever feel pain at the back of her neck? There were some other questions Axel could now no longer remember, but Beatrice had replied in the negative to one after the next, and the more she did so, the more pleased Axel had become. Only once, when Jonas asked if she had noticed blood in her urine, and she replied that yes, sometimes she had, and did, did Axel feel uneasy? But the monk had no nodded as though this was normal to be expect and and to be expected, and gone straight to straight on to the next question. How then had this examination ended? He remembered Father Jonas smiling and saying, So you can now go to your son with nothing to fear and Axel saying to and Axel himself saying, You see, Princess, I always knew it was nothing. Then the monk had eased himself carefully back down in his bed and lain there, recovering his breath. In Ninian's absence, Axel had hurried to fill the monk's drinking cup from the mug, from the jug, and he had placed it next to the sick man's mouth, had seen tiny droplets of blood slide from the lower lips spread into the water. Then Father Jonas had looked up at Beatrice and said, Mistress, you seem so happy to know the truth about this thing you call the mist. Happy indeed, Father. For now, there's a way forward for us. Take care, for it's a secret guarded jealousy by some. Though it may be for the best, it remains the it, re, it remains so no longer. It's not for me to care if it's a secret or not, Father. But I am glad Axel and I know it and can now act on it. Yet you are so certain, good mistress. You wish to be free from of this mist, is it not? Better some things remain hidden from our minds. It may be so for, for some, father, but not for us. Axel and I wish to have again the happy moments that we shared together. To be robbed of them is as if a thief came in the night and took what's most precious from us. Yet, the mist covers all memories, the bad as well as the good. Isn't that so, mistress? We'll, s we'll have the bad ones come back too, even if they make us weep or shake with anger. For isn't it the life we have shared? You have no fear then of bad memories, mistress. What's to fear, father? What Axel and I feel today in our hearts for each other tells us the path taken here can hold no danger for us, no matter how, no matter that. No matter that the mist hides it now, it's like a tale with happy end. When even a child knows not to fear the twists and turns before, Axel and I would remember our life together, whatever its shape, for it's been a thing dear to us. A bird must have flown across the ceiling above him. The sound had startled him, and then Axel realized that for a moment or two, he had actually been asleep. He realized too there were no more woodcutting noise, and the grounds were silent. Had the warriors returned to their chamber, Axel had heard nothing, and there were no signs beyond the dark shapes of the table of anyone sleeping on Edwin's side of the room. What had Father Jonas said after examining Beatrice and concluding with his questions? Yes, she had said he had noticed blood in her urine, but he had smiled and asked something else. You see, princess, Axel had said, I always told you it was nothing. And Father Jonas had smiled despite his wounds and his exhaustion and said, you can go to your son with nothing to fear. But this had never been to the question Beatrice had feared. Beatrice knew, he knew, 
feared the boatman's questions, harder to under harder to answer than Father Jonas's, and that's what and that was what and that was why she had been so pleased to learn the cause of the mist. Axel, do you hear that? She had been triumphant. Axel, do you hear that? She had said, her face radiant. That's the end of chapter 6. Hello, welcome to my stream. Welcome, welcome. Uh, I'm not sure if Dark Rai 091 is still in the chat, but uh, you redeem and read a quote on love. Uh, I will only do the redemption after I finish reading the chapters that I'm supposed to read today. Today, I hope you don't mind that, and I apologize if you are not in the stream anymore. Yeah. <coughs> Let us continue with chapter 7. We are currently reading um, Kazuo Ishiguro's The Buried Giant. Just give me one moment, I'm sorry. Uh, one minute please.
Oh, I'm back, sorry. Oh, okay, sorry. I was. I have to do something. Okay, alright, let's go. Hang on. Sorry, sorry. Okay, we're currently reading Kazui Shiguro as the Bird Giant, Part 2, Chapter 7. Han had been shaking him, but by the time Axel sat up, the figure was already on the other side of the room, bending over Edwin and whispering, Quickly, boy, quickly, and not a sound. Beatrice was awake beside him, and Axel stood unsteadily to his feet, the cold air startling him, and then reached down to grab his wife's outstretched hand. It was still the death of night. But voices were calling outside, and surely torches had been lit in the courtyard below, for there were now illuminated patches on the wall facing the window. The monks who now awoken them was dragging the boy half asleep over to their side, and Axel recognized Father, Father Brian's limping gait before his, his face emerged from the dark. I'll try to save you, friends, Father Brian said, his voice still a whisper. But you must be quick and do as I say. There are soldiers arrived, twenty, even thirty, with with a will to hunt you down. They already have the older Saxon brother trapped, but he's a lively one and kept them occupied and giving you a chance to escape. Be still, boy. Stay with me. Edwin was moving to the window, but Father Brian had reached out and clasped his arm. I mean to lead you to safety, but we must first leave this chamber unseen. Soldiers acro soldiers cross the square below, but their eyes are on the tower where the Saxon still holds out. With God's help, they won't notice us go down the steps outside, and then the worst will be behind us. But cause no sound to make their gazes turn, and there not to trip on these steps. I'll descend first, then signal your moment to follow. No, mistress, you must leave your bundle here. Let it in let it be enough to keep your lives. They crouched uh, they crouched near the door and listened to Father Brian's footsteps des descend with agonizing slowness. Eventually, when Axel peered cautiously through the doorway, he saw torches moving at the far end of the courtyard, but before he could discern clearly what was going on, his attention was drawn by Father Brian, standing directly below and signaling frantically. The staircase, running diagonally down to the side of the wall, was mostly in shadow except for one patch, quite near the ground, lit up brightly but in, by the nearly full moon. Follow close behind me, princess, Axel said. Don't look across the yard, but keep your eyes on where your foot may find the next step, or it will be a hard fall and only enemies to come to our aid. Tell the boy what I have just said and let this, let have this behind us. Despite his own instructions, Axel could not help glancing across the courtyard as he went down. On the far side, soldiers had gathered around a cylindrical stone tower overlooking the building in which the monks had earlier had their meeting. Blazing torches were being waved and there appeared to be disorder in their ranks. When Axel was, was halfway down the steps, two soldiers broke away and came running across the square and he was sure they would be spotted. But the man vanished into a doorway and before long Axel was gratefully ushering both Beatrice Beatrice and Edwin into the shadows of the, of the cloisters where Father Brian was waiting. They followed the monk along narrow corridors, some of which may have been the same as those taken earlier with the silent Father Minion. Often they moved through complete darkness, following the rhythmic hiss of their guides' drag food. 
Then they came into a chamber whose ceiling had parted, fallen away. Moonlight was pouring in, revealing piles of wooden boxes and broken furniture. Axel could smell mold and, and stagnant water. Take heart, friends, Father Brian said, no longer whispering. He had gone into a corner and was moving up Jack's aside. You are nearly safe. Father, Father, Axel said, we are grateful to you for this rescue, but tell us what has occurred. Father Brian continued clearing the corner and did not look up as he said, It's a mystery to us, sir. They came this night without invitation, pouring through the gates and through our homes as if it was their own. They demanded the two young Saxons lately arrived here, and though they made no mentions of you and your wife, I wouldn't trust that them to treat you gently. This boy here, they would clearly wish to murder, as they do even now, his brother. You must save yourself, and there will be time later to ponder the soldier's ways. Master Winston was a stranger to us only this morning. Beatrice said, yet we are uneasy making our escape while a terrible fate threatens him. The soldiers may yet, came to, may yet come to our heels, mistress, for we left no barred doors behind us. And if that fellow bravely buys your escape, even with his own life, you must grasp it gratefully. Under this trap door, there is a tunnel dug in an ancient times. It will take you underground into the forest where you will emerge far from your pursuers. Now help me raise it, sir, for it's too heavy for my hands alone. Even for the two of them, it took some effort to raise the door till it stood up at a steep angle before them, revealing a square of deeper blackness. Let the boy go down first, the monk said, for it's years since any of us used this passage and who knows if the steps haven't crumbled. He's nimble-footed and could take a fall better. But Edwin was saying something to Beatrice and she said now, Master Edwin would go to Master Winston's aid. Tell him, princess, we might help Winston yet by making our escape through this tunnel. Tell the boy what you must and be um, but pursued but persuade him to come quickly. As Beatrice spoke to him, a change seems to come over the boy. He kept staring at the hole on the floor and his eyes caught in the moonlight seemed to Axel at that moment to have something strange about them, as though he was steadily coming under a spell. Then, even as Beatrice was speaking, Edwin walked towards the trapdoor and without looking back at them, stepped into the blackness and vanished. As his footsteps grew fainter, Axel took Beatrice's hand and said, Let's go too, princess. Stay close with me. The steps, leading underground, were shallow, flat stones sunk into earth. The soldier sorry, felt solid enough. <clears throat> felt solid enough. They could see something of the way ahead of them by the light from the open trap door above them. But just as Axel turned to speak to Father Brian, the door closed with what seemed a thunderous crash. They all three stopped and for a while remained quite still. The air did not feel as still as, Ma as Axel had expected. In fact, he thought he could feel a faint breeze. Somewhere in front of them, Edwin started to speak and Beatrice answered him in a whisper. Then she said softly, The boy asked why Father Brian closed the door on us as he did. I told him it was mostly... I told him he was mostly likely most likely anxious to hide the tunnel from the other soldiers, maybe even now entering the room. All the same, Axel, it struck me a little queer too. And isn't that him now, surely, moving objects over the door? If we find a way ahead if we find a way if we, if we find a way ahead obstructed by earth or water, the father himself saying it's years since anyone came this way. How will we return and open the door? The way it's so heavy and now with objects above it. Queer sounds right. But there's no doubting there's so the soldiers in the monastery. For didn't we see them ourselves just now? I don't see what choice we have but to go on and pray this tunnel. Bring us safety, safely to the forest. Tell the boy to keep moving forward. But slowly and always a hand to his mossy wall, for I fear this passage will only grow darker. Yet, 
as they went forward, they found there was a feeble light, so that at times they could even make out each other's outline. There were sudden puddles that surprised their feet, and more than once during this phase of their journey, Axel thought he heard a noise up ahead. But since neither Edwin nor Beatrice reached reacted he put it down to his overwrought imagination but then edwin suddenly halted almost causing axel to collide into him he felt beatrice behind him squeezing his hand and for a moment they stood there very still in the dark then beatrice moved even closer to him her breath felt warm to on his neck as she said in the softest of whispers do you hear it axel hear what princess Edwin's hand touched him warningly, and they were silent again. Eventually, Beatrice said in his ear, There's something in something here with us, Axel. Perhaps a bat, princess, or a rat. No, Axel. I hear it now. It's a man's breathing. Axel listened again. Then there came a sharp noise, striking sound. Repeating three times, four times, just beyond where they were standing, there were bright flashes, then a tiny flame which grew momentarily to reveal the shape of a seated man. Then all was dark again. Fear not, friends, a voice said. It's only Gawain, Arthur's knight, and as soon as his tinder lights will see each other's better. There were more noises of flint, then eventually... A candle flamed and began to burn steadily. Sir Gawain was sitting in a dark mound. It evidently did not make an ideal seat, for he was at an odd angle, like a giant doll about to topple. The candle on his hand il illuminated his face and his upper torso with wobbling shadows, and he was breathing heavily. As before, he was in a tunic and armor, his sword unsheathed had been thrust at an angle into the ground near the foot of the mound. He stared at them balefully, moving the candle from one face to, to the next. So you're all here, he said finally. I am relieved. You surprised us, Sir Gawain, Axel said. What do you mean by hiding yourself here? I've been down here a while and walking before you, friends, yet... With this sword and armor and my great height, which forced me to stumble and go with bowed head, I can't walk quickly, and now you discover me. You hardly explain yourself, sir. Why do you walk before us? To defend you, sir. The melancholy truth is the monk have deceived you. There's a beast dwell down here, and they mean you to perish by it. Happily, not every monk thinks alike. Ninian, the silent one, brought me down here unseen, and I will guide you to safety yet. Your news overwhelms us, Sir Gawain, said Axel. But first tell us of this beast that you speak of. What its nature, and does it threaten us even as we stand here? Assume it does, sir. The monks wouldn't have sent you down here if they didn't mean you to meet the beast. It's always their way, as men's of as men of Christ, it's beyond them to use sword and even poison, so they send you down here to those they wish that sorry, so they that so they send down here those they wish that, and in a day or two they'll have forgotten they ever did so. Oh yes, that's their way, especially the ab the abbots. By Sunday, he may even have convinced himself that he saved you from those soldiers. And the work of whatever prowls in this tunnel, should it cross his mind, kill his own, and even call God's will. Well, let's see what God, God wills tonight, now a knight of Arthur walks before you. You are saying, Sir Gawain? Be Beatrice asked. The monks what, wish us dead? They certainly wish this boy dead, mistress. I tried to make them see it wasn't necessary, even made a solemn promise to him. To take him far away from this country but no they don't listen to me they won't risk this boy loose even even with master wisdom captured or killed for who's to say there won't come some other fellow one day to find this boy i'll take him far away i said but they fear what may happen 
what may happen and I and wish him dead. You and your good husband, they might have spared, but you but that you inevitably be witnesses to their deeds. Had I seen all this in advance, would I have travelled here to this monastery? Who knows? It seemed my duty then, did it not? But their plans for the boy and for an innocent Christian couple, I could not allow it. Luckily, not all the monks think alike, you know? And Ninin, the silent one, let me down here unwatched. It was my intention to go before you much further, but this armor and my stumbling height, how many times over the years have I cursed this height? What advantage does it, does it bring a man to be so tall? For every high dangling pair I reach, there has been an arrow threatened me. Would I have flown over a smaller man? Sir Gawain, Axel said, what kind of beast is it? This one you say dwells down here? I never saw it, sir. Only know who those the monks sent this way perish by it. Is it one that can be killed by an ordinary sword held by a mortal man? What do you say, sir? I am a mortal man, I don't deny it. But I am a knight, well trained and nurtured for long years of my youth by the great Arthur, who taught me to face all manner of challenges with gladness, even when the fear seeps to the marrow. For if we are all, for if we are mortal, let us shine handsomely in God's eye. God's eyes while we walk this earth. Like all stood with Arthur, sir, I have faced Beelzebub's and mon monsters, as well as the darkest intent of man, and always upheld my great king's example, even in the midst of ferocious conflict. What is it you su what is it you suggest, sir? How dare you? Were you there? I was there, sir, and saw all with the same eyes that fix you now. But what of it? What of it, friends? This is a discussion for some other time. Forgive me, we have other matters to attend to. Of course we have. What is it that you ask? Ah, uh, yes. What is it that you ask? Ah, uh, yes, this beast. Yes, yes, yes. I understand it. It's monstrous fears, but no demon or spirits, and this sword is good enough to slay it. But Sir Gawain, Beatrice said, do you really propose we walk further down this tunnel, knowing we now know, knowing we now do? What choice we have, mistress? If I'm not mistaken, the way back to the monastery is locked to us, and yet the same door may open any time to pour for soldiers into the tunnel there's nothing for it but to go on but and but for one this beast is our way we may soon find ourselves in the forest far away from your pursuers for Ninian assures me this is a true tunnel and well maintained so let so let be so let's be on our way before this t candle burns down it's the only one I have do we trust him Axel Beatrice asked, making no effort to prevent Sir Gawain he hearing. My mind's giddy now, and loath to believe our kind father Brian's betrayed us, yet what this knight says has the ring of truth to it. Let's follow him, princess. Sir Gawain, we thank you for your trouble. Please lead us now to safety and let hope this beast dozing or gone prowling the night. I fear we have no such luck. But come, friends, we'll go with courage. The old knight rose slowly to his feet, then held out the candle at arm's length. Master Axel, perhaps you carry for us this flame, for I'll need both my hands to keep my sword at the ready. They went on into the tunnel, Sir Gawain leading, Axel following with the flame, Beatrice holding his arm from behind, and Edwin now at the rear. It was... It was no option but to go in a single file, the passage remaining red narrow, and the ceiling of dang dangling moss and sinewy roots grew lower and lower until Beatrice had to stoop. Axel did his best to hold the candle high, but the breeze in the tunnel was now stronger, and he was now obliged to lower it and cover the flame with his other hand. 
Sir Gawain, though never complained, his shape going before them, sword raised over his shoulder, seemed never to vary. Then, then Beatrice let out an exclamation and tugged Axel's arm. What is it, princess? Oh, Axel, stop! My foot stood something then, but your candle moved too quickly. What of it, princess? We have to move on. Axel, I thought it a child. My foot touched it. I saw it before your light passed. I believe it's a small dead as a small child long dead. There, princess, don't distress yourself. Where was it you saw it? Come, come, friends, Sir Gawain said in the dark. Many things in this place are best left unseen. Hello, Keen, Komodo. Beatrice seemed not to hear the night. It's over here, Axel. Bring the flame this way, down there. Axel, shine it down there. Uh, though I dread to see its poor face again. Despite his counsel, Sir Gawain had doubled back and Edwin too now was at Beatrice's side. Axel crouched forward and moved the candle here and there, revealing damp earth, tree roots and stones. Then, the flame illuminated a large bat lying on its back as though peacefully asleep, wings stretched out, its fur looked wet and sticky. The, wing, the pig-like face, face was hairless and little puddles had formed in the cavities of the outspread wings. The creature might indeed have been sleeping but for what was on the front of its torso, as Axel brought the flames even closer, they all stared at the circular hole, extending from just below the bat's breast down to its belly, taking in parts of the ribcage to the either side. The, wo the wound was peculiarly clean, as though someone had taken a bite from a creep's apple. What could have done work like this? Axel asked. He must have moved the candle too swiftly, for at that moment, the flame gutted and went out. Don't worry, friends, Sir Gawain said. I'll find my tinder again. Didn't I tell you, Axel? Beatrice sounded close to tears. I knew it was a baby the moment my foot touched it. What are you saying, princess? It's not a baby. What are you saying? What could have happened to the poor child? And what of its parents? Princess, it's simply a baby. Bat, the lack of which often haunts dark places. Oh, Axel, it was a baby. I'm sure of it. I'm sorry this flames out the princess, but I'll or I'll show you again. A bat it is, nothing more. Yet myself, I'll look again at what it lies on. Sir Gawain, did you notice a creature's bed? I don't know what you mean, sir. It seems to me the creature lies on a bed of bones. For I thought I saw a skull or two that could be, that could only have been belonged to men. What do you suggest, sir? Sir Gawain's voice became carelessly loud. What skulls? I saw those skulls, sir. Only a bat fallen on misfortune. Beatrice was now sobbing quietly, and Axel straightened to embrace her. It was no child, princess, he said more gently. Don't upset yourself. Such a lonely death. Where were its parents, Axel? What are you suggesting, sir? Skulls? I saw no skulls. And what if there are a few old bones here? What of it? Is that anything extraordinary? Aren't we underground? But I saw no beds of bones. I don't know what you suggest, Master Axel. Were you there, sir? Did you stand beside the great Arthur? I'm proud to say I did, sir, and he was a commander of merciful as he was gallant. Yes, indeed, it was I who came to the abbot to warn Master Winston's identity and intention. What choice had I? Was I to guess how dark the hearts of this holy man could turn? Your suggestions are unwarranted, sir, an insult to all who ever stood alongside the great Arthur. There's no bed of bones here, and, and, and am I not here now to save you? Sir Gawain, your voice booms too much and who knows where the soldiers are at this moment. What could I do, sir, knowing what I did? Yes, I wrote here and spoke to the abbot, yet how was I to know the darkness of that man's heart? And the better man, poor Jonas, his liver packed and his days not long, while that abbot leaves on with barely a scratch from those birds. Sir Gawain's broke off. 
interrupted by a noise from further down the tunnel. It was hard to determine how distant or near it had been, but the sound was unmistakably unmistak the cry of a beast. It had resembled the howl of a wolf, though there had been something deeper roar of a bear. The cry had not been prolonged, but it made Axel clap Beatrice to him, and Sir Gawain snatched his sword from outside the ground. Then, for several moments, they remained standing in silence, listening for the sound to return. But, but nothing further came, and suddenly, Sir Gawain began to laugh quietly and breathlessly. As his, as his laughter went on, Beatrice said to Axel's ear, Let's leave this place, husband. I wish no more reminding of this lonely grave. Sir Gawain stopped laughing and said, Perhaps we heard then the beast, but we have no choice but to go on. So friends, let's finish our quarrel. We'll light the candle again before long and let's go a little way now without it in case it hastened the beast on our way. See? Here's a pale light and enough to walk by. Come, my friends. No more of this quarrel. My sword's ready, ready and con let's continue. The tunnel became more torturous. They moved with greater caution, fearing what each turn would reveal, but they encountered nothing, nor they heard the cry again. The tunnel descended steeply for good distance before coming out into the large underground chamber. They all paused to recover their breath and look around at their new surroundings. After the long walk with the earth brushing their heads, it was a relief to see the ceiling, not only so high above them, them but composed of more solid material. Once Sir Gawain had lit the candle again, Axel realized that they were in some sort of mo mausoleum surrounded by walls bearing traces of murals and Roman letters. Before them, a pair of substantial pillars form a gateway into a further chamber of comparable proportions and falling across this threshold was an intense pool of moonlight. Its source was not obvious. Perhaps somewhere behind the high arc across the two pillars were now an open were now an opening which at the moment by sheer chance was aligned to receive the moon. The light illuminated much of the moss and fungus of the pillars as well as a section of the next chamber whose floor appeared to be covered in rubble, but which Axel soon realized was comprised of a vast layer of bones. Only then it did it occur to him that under his feet were more broken skeletons and that this strange floor extended the entirety of both chambers. This must be some kind of burial place, he said aloud. Yet there are so many buried here. A burial place? Sir Gawain muttered. Yes, a burial place. He had been moving slowly around the chambers, sword in one hand, candle on the other. Now he went towards the ark and stopped short of, of the second chamber, as if suddenly daunted by the brilliant moon moonlight. He thrust his sword into the ground and Axel watched his silhouette leaning on his weapon, moving the candle up and down with weary air. We need not quarrel, Master Axel. Here are the skulls of men I won't deny. There's an arm, there's a leg, but just bones now. An old burial ground. And so it may be. I dare say, sir, our whole country is this way. A fine green valley, a pleasant corpse in the springtime. Dig its soil. Not far beneath the daisies and buttercups come the dead. And I don't talk, I don't talk sir, only of those who receive Christian burial. Beneath our soil lie the remains of old slaughter, horrors and I. We, are we have grown weary of it, weary, and we are no longer young. Sir Gawain, Axel said, we have but one sword between us. I ask you not to grow melancholic, nor forget the beast is near. I don't forget the beast, sir. I merely consider this gateway before us. Look up there, you see it? Sir Gawain was holding up the candle to reveal along the lower edge of the ark what appeared to be a row of spearheads pointing down to the ground. A portcullis, a portcullis, Axel said. Exactly, sir. 
This gate is not so ancient. Younger than either of us, I'll wager. Someone has raised it for us, wishing us to pass through. See there, the ropes that holds it. It, and there, the pulleys. Someone comes here often to make this gate rise and fall. Perhaps feed the beast. Sir Gawain stepped forward, stepped towards one of the pillars. His feet crunching over the bones. If I cut this rope, the gate will surely come down. But it will bar our way out. Yet, if the beast beyond will be shielded from it, and that the Saxon boy I hear from some pixie stolen in here. Indeed, Edwin, back in the shadows, had started to sing faintly at first, so that Axel had thought the boy was simply soothing his nerve. But then, his voice had suddenly had become steadily more conspicuous. His song seemed to be slow, to be a slow lullaby. And he was rendering it with his face to the, to the wall, his body rocking gently. The boy behaves as one bewitched, Sir Gawain said. Never mind him. We must decide now, Master Axel. Do we walk on? Or do we cut this rope to give us at least a moment of shield from what lies beyond? I say we cut the rope, sir. I am sure. We can surely raise the gate again when we wish. Let's discover what we face while the gate's down. Wise counsel, sir. I'll do as you say. Handling, handing Axel the candle, Sir Gawain took a further step forward, raised his sword and swung it at the pillar. There was a sound of metal striking a stone, and then the lower section of the gate shook but remained suspended. Sir Gawain sighed at the hint of embarrassment. Then he, repo then he repositioned himself, raised the sword again and struck once more. This time, there was a snapping sound, and the gate crashing down, raising a cloud of dust in the moonlight. The noise felt immense. Edwin abruptly stopped his singing, and Axel stared through the iron grid now fallen before them to see what it would summon. But there was no sign of the beast, and after a moment they all let go of their breath. For all that they, they were now effectively trapped, the lowering of those portcullis brought a sense of relief, and they all for began to wander around the mausoleum. Sir Gawain, who had sheathed his, sh his sword, went up to the bars and touched them gingerly. Good iron, he said. It will do its work. Beatrice, who had been quiet for some time, came up to Axel and pressed her head against his chest. As he put his arms around her, he realized her cheek was now wet with tears. Come, princess, he said. Take heart. We'll be out in the night air before long. All these skulls, Axel. So many. How can this beast really have killed so many? What? She spoke, she spoke softly, but Sir Gawain turned to them. What do you suggest, mistress? That I committed this slaughter? He said this tiredly, with none the anger he had shown earlier at the tunnel, but there was a peculiar intensity in his voice. So many skulls, you say. Yet, are we not underground? What is it that you suggest? Can one, can just one knight of Arthur have killed so many? He turned back to the gate and ran a finger along the bars. Once, many years ago in a dream, I watched myself killing the enemy. It was in my dream long ago. The enemy, in their hundreds, perhaps as many as this, I fought and fought. Just a foolish dream, but I still recall it. He sighed and then looked at Beatrice. <sighs> I hardly know how to answer you, mistress. I acted as though as I would please God. How was I to guess how dark had grown the hearts of these wretched monks? Horace and I came to the monastery while the sun was up, not long ago after you yourself arrived. For I suppose then I need to speak urgently with the abbot. Then I discovered what he plotted against you, and I feigned complacent, bade him goodbye, and they all believed me gone, but I left Horace in the forest. And return up here on foot hidden in the night not all monks think alike thank god i knew the good jonas would receive me and learning from the abbot's scheme i had ninian bring me unseen down to this place await you curse it the boy starts again surely enough edwin was singing once more not as loudly as before but now in a curious posture he had bent forward a feast to each temple 
and was moving slowly about in the shadows like someone in a dance enacting the part of an animal. The recent events surely overwhelm him, Axel said. It's a wonder he has shown the fortitude he has, and we must attend to him well once we are away from here. But Sir Gawain, tell us now, why do the monks seek to, seek to murder such an innocent lad? No matter how I argued, sir, the abbot would have the boy destroyed. So I left horrors in the forest and retraced my step. Sir Gawain, please explain. Has this to do has this to do, to do with his ogre's wound? Yet these are men of Christian learning. That's no ogre wound. That's no ogre's bite. The boy carries is a dragon gave him that wound. I saw it right away when, when yesterday that soldier raised his shirt. Who knows what he met with the dragon. But a dragon bite it is. And now the desire will be rising in his blood to seek congress with the she-dragon. And in turn, any she-dragon near enough to send him will come seeking him. That is why Master Winston will lead him to Kyrick. Uh, this is why Master Winston was so fond of his protege, sir. He, believe, he believes Master Edwin will lead him to Kyrick. And for this same reason, the monks and these soldiers would have him dead. Look, the boy grows ever wilder. What are these skulls, sir? The Beat Beatrice suddenly asked the knight, Why so many? Can they all have belonged to babies? Some sh some surely enough, small enough to fit, fit in your palm. Princess, don't distress yourself. This is a bureau place, nothing more. What is it that you suggest, mistress? The skull of babes? I fought men, bees or bubs, dragons, and for the slaughterer of infants. How dare you, mistress? So suddenly Edwin, still singing, Pushed past them and going up the porticles, pressed himself against the bars. Get back, boy! Sir Gawain said, grasping his shoulders. There's, there's danger here. There's enough of your songs! Edwin gripped the bars with both hands, and for a moment he and the old knight tussled, and then both of them broke off and stepped back from the gate. Beatrice, at Axel's breast, let out a small gasp, but at the instant, Axel's view was obscured by Edwin and Sir Gawain. Then the beast came into the pool of moonlight and he saw it more clearly. God protect us, Beatrice said. He is a creature escaped from the great plain itself. The air grows colder. Don't worry, princess. It can't breach those bars. Sir Gawain, who had immediately drawn his sword again, began to laugh quietly. <laughs> Not nearly as bad as I feared. He said, then laugh a little more. Surely bad enough, sir, Axel said. It looks well able to devour each of us in turn. They might be they might have been gazing at a large skinned animal. The opaque membrane, like the lining of a sheep's stomach, was stretched tightly over the sinews and joints. Swathed as it was now in moon shadow, the beast appeared roughly like the size and shape of a bull, but its head was distinctly wolf-like and of darker hue. Though even here, the impression was of blackening of flames ra rather than the naturally dark fur of flesh. The jaws were massive and the eyes reptilian. Sir Gawain was still laughing to himself, coming down that gloomy tunnel. My wild imaginings had read it me for worse. Once, sir, on the marshes of these dumbums, of the dumbums, I faced wolves with heads of hideous hags, and at Mount Colwich, double-headed ogres that spewed blood at you even as they roared their battle cry. Here's a little more than an angry dog. Yet, it bars our way to freedom, Sir Gawain. It does that for sure. So we may stare at it for an hour until, it's, until the soldiers come down the tunnel behind us, or we may lift the gate and fight it. I'm inclined to think of, of it a, dark, a foe darker than a fierce dog, Sir Gawain. I ask you not to, gro not to grow complacent. I am an old man, sir. And, and it's many years since I swung a sword in anger. Yet, I am still a knight and well trained, and if, this beast, and if this be a beast of the earth, I'll get the better of it. See, Axel, Beatrice said, how its eyes follows Master Edwin. 
as we now strangely calm, have been walking exper experimentally, first left, then to the right, always staring back at the beast whose gaze never left him. The dog hungers for the boy, Sir Gawain said thoughtfully. It may be there's dragon spawn within this monster. Whatever its nature, Axel said. It awaits our next move with strange patience. Let Then let me propose this, friends, said Sir Gawain. I'm loath to use this Saxon boy like a young goat tied to a trap tied to trap a wolf, yet he seems a brave lad, and in no less danger, wandering here weaponless. Let him take the candle and go stand there, in the back of the chamber. Then you, Master Axel, can somehow raise the beast uh, raise this gate again, perhaps with your good wife's help, the beast will be free to come through. My fancy is it will make straight for the boy. Knowing the path of its of its charge, I'll stand here and cut it down as it passes. Do you approve this do you approve the scheme, sir? It's a desperate one. Yet I too fear the soldier will soon discover this tunnel, so let's try it, sir, even with my wife and and I hanging together on the rope. <clears throat> and we'll do our best to, to raise this gate. Princess, explain to Master Edwin our plan and let's see if he'll enter to it. But Edwin seemed to have grasped Sir Gawain's strategy without a word being said to him. Taking the candle from the night, the, the boy maneuvered out ten good strides over the bones till he was back in the shadows. When he turned again and the candle bef turned again, the candle below his face barely trembled and revealed blazing eyes fixed on the creatures beyond the bars. Quick then, princess, Axel said. Climb up my back and try to reach the rope's end and see where, where it dangles there. At first, they nearly toppled over. Then they used the pillar itself to support them. And after a little more groping, he, he heard her say, I hold it, Axel. Release me and it will surely come down with me. Catch me so I don't fall at once. Sir Gawain, Axel called softly. Are you ready, sir? We are ready. If the beast passes you, then surely it's the end of this brave boy. I know it, sir, and it will not pass. Let me down slowly, Axel. If I'm still in the air holding the rope, reach down and tuck me down. Axel released Beatrice and for an instant she hung suspended in the air. Her body weights insufficient. To raise the gate, then Axel managed to grip another portion of the rope close to her with, with close to her two hands, and they tugged together. At first, nothing happened. Then something yielded, and the gate rose with, with a shudder. Axel continued tugging, and unable to see the effect, called out, "Is it high yet, sir?" There was a pause before Sir Gawain's voice came back. The dog stares our way, and nothing now between us. Twisting, Axel looked around the pillar in, in time to see the beast leap forward. The old knight's face caught in the moonlight looked aghast as he swung his sword but too late. The creature was past him and moving unerring, unerringly towards Edwin. The boy's eyes grew large but he did not drop the candle. Instead, he moved aside almost as if out of politeness to let the beast pass and to Axel's surprise, the creature did not did just that running into the blackness of the tunnel out of which long ago they had all emerged. I'll hold it up yet, I'll hold it up yet, Axel shouted. Cross the threshold and save yourself. But neither Beatrice beside him nor Sir Gawain who had lowered his sword seemed to hear. Even Edwin appeared to have lost interest in the terrible creature that had just sped past him and, and would surely return any moment. The boy Candle held before him, came over to where the old knight was standing. Together they stared down at the ground. Let the gate fall, Master Axel, Sir Gawain said without looking up. We'll raise it again soon enough. The old knight and the boy, Axel realized, were regarding the fascination something moving on the ground before them. He let the gate fall, and as he did so, Beatrice said, I fear something, Axel. I have no need to see it, but go and look if you will tell and if you will and tell me what you see. Didn't the beast run into the tunnel, princess? Some of it did. I I heard its footsteps. 
Now, Axel, go and see. The part of it lies at the knight's feet. As Axel came forward towards them, Sir Gawain and Edwin both started as though shaken from a trance. Then they moved aside and, and Axel saw the beast's hand in the moonlight. The jaws would not cease. Sir Gawain said in a perturbed tone, I've, I have a mind to take my sword to it, yet fear that it would be a desecration to bring more evil upon us, yet I wish it I wish it would cease moving. Indeed, it was hard to believe the second the severe Tate was not a living thing, as it lay on its side, the one visible eye gleaming like a sea creature, the jaws moved rhythmic rhythmic rhythmically rhythmically with a strange energy, so that the tongue flopping amidst the teeth stirred appeared to stir with life. We are beholden to you, Sir Gawain, Axel said. It's a mere dog, sir, and I happily face worse. Yet this Saxon boy shows rare courage, and I'm glad to have done, done him some service. But now we must hurry on, and with caution too, for who we know, who knows what occurs above us, or even if a second beast awaits beyond that chamber. They now discover a crank be behind one of the pillars and fastening the rope to end, to end it, soon raise the gate with, without difficulty. Leaving the beast's head where it has fallen, they had passed under the particles. Sir Gawain once more, leading sword poised, and Edwin at the at the rear, at the rear. The second chamber of the mausoleum showed clear signs of having served as the beast lair amidst the ancient bones with fresher carcasses of sheep and deer, as well as other dark, foul-smelling shapes that they could not identify. Then they were once more. Walking stooped and, and short of breath along the winding passage, they encountered no more bees, and eventually they heard a bird song. A patch of light appeared in the distance, and then they come out into the forest in the early dawn all around them. In a kind of days, Axel came upon a cluster of roots rising between two large trees, and taking Beatrice's hand, helped her sit down on it. At first, Beatrice was was too short of breath to speak, but soon after a moment she looked up and saying, There's room here beside me, husband. If you are safe for now, let's sit together and watch the stars fade. I'm thankful we are both well and the evil tunnels behind us. Then she said, Where's Master Edwin? Axel, I don't see him. Looking about him, in the half-light, Axel spotted Sir Gawain's figure, silhouette against the dawn, head bowed, a hand on the tree trunk to steady him while, while he regained his breath. But there, but there was no sign of the boy. Just now he was behind us, Axel said. I even heard him exclaim as we came into fresh air. I watched him hasten on, sir, Sir Gawain said without turning his breath, still laboured. Not being elderly as the rest of us, he no need, he's no need to lean on Oak's pan panting and gasping. I suppose he hurries back to the monastery to rescue Master Wiston. Didn't you think to delay him, sir? Surely he hurries to grave danger, and Master Wiston by now killed or, or captured. What would you have me do, sir? I did all I could. Hid myself in the airless place, overcame the beast though it had devoured many brave men before us. Then at the end of it all, a boy runs back to the monastery. Am I to give chase to this? Give chase with this heavy armor and sword? I'm all done in, sir. All done in. What's my duty now? I must pause and think it over. What would Arthur have me do? Are we to understand, Sir Gawain? Mistress, uh, uh Beatrice asked. That it was you in the first place to come and tell the abbot of the Master Wisdom's real identity as a Saxon warrior from the east. Why go through it again, mistress? Did I not lead you to safety? So many skulls we trod upon before coming to this sweet dawn. So many. No need to look down. One hears the crackle with each tread. How many dead, sir? A hundred? A thousand? Did you count, Master Axel? Or were you not there, sir? He was still a silhouette beside a tree, his words sometimes hard to catch now the birds had begun their early chorus. Whatever the history of, of this night, Axel said, we owe you much thanks, Sir Gawain. Clearly, your courage and skills remain undimin undiminished. 
Yet, I too have a question to put to you. Spare me, sir. Enough. How can I chase a nimble youth up these wooded slopes? I'm drained, sir, and perhaps not just out of breath. Sir Gawain, were we not comrades once long ago? Spare me, sir. I did my duty tonight. Is that not enough? Now I must go find my poor Horace tied to a branch so he wouldn't wonder. Yet what if a wolf or bear comes upon him? The mist hangs heavily across my past, Axel said. Yet lately I found myself reminded of some task and one of, gra of gravity with which I was one once entrusted. Was it law? A great law to bring all men closer to God. Your presence and your talk of Arthur stirs long faded thoughts, Sir Gawain. My poor Horace, sir, so dislikes the forest at night, the hooting house, and the screech of a fox is enough to frighten him. No matter, he'll face a shower of arrows without flinching. I'll go to him now, and let me urge you, good people, not to rest here too late. Forget the young Saxons, the pair of them. Think now of your own cherished son waiting for you at his village. Best go on your way quickly, I say. Now you are without your blankets and provisions. The river is near, and the fast current on its flowing east. A friendly word with a bargeman may secure you a ride downstream. But don't dally here, for who knows when the soldiers will come this way. God protect you, friends. With a rustle and a few thumbs, Sir Gawain form disappeared into the dark foliage. After a moment, Beatrice said, We didn't bid him farewell, Axel, and I feel poorly for that. Yet, that was a strange leave he took of us and sudden one. I, I thought so too, princess. But perhaps he gave us wise counsel. We should hurry to our son and never mind our recent companions. I feel concerned. For Master Edwin, yet if he'll hasten back to the monastery, what can we do for him? Let's just rest for a moment longer, Axel. Soon we'll be on our way, just the two of us, and we'll do well to seek a barge to speed our journey. Our son must be wondering what keeps us. That was chapter 7. I have changed my mind. Um... I'm going to read only until chapter 9, which is the end of part 2. And then, it will be a 4-day reading instead of a 3 days reading. Because I realized I'm too old to be doing 4, hour, four hours reading anymore. I should go back to my two hour reading. All these new books that I'm reading, they are so long. I have to unfortunately put them at four days reading. This is a very long book as well. But it's interesting. It's quite fun so far. Okay. Let me cook me. Chapter 8. And this will be the last chapter for today, okay? The young monk was thin, sickly looking pig who spoke Edwin's language well. No doubt he had been delighted to have him to have in his company someone nearer to his own age and for the first uh, part of the journey down through the dawn mist he had spoke with relish so but since entering the trees the young monk had fallen silent and edwin now wondered if he had in some way offended his guide more likely the monk was simply anxious not not to attract attention of whatever lurked in these woods amidst the, the pleasant bird songs there had been some strange hissings and murmurs. When Edwin had asked once again more from a wish to break the silence than, than for reassurance, So, my brother's wounds seem not to be mortal? 
the reply had been most curt. Father Jonas said not. There's none wiser. Winston then could not could not be so badly hurt. Indeed, he must have managed this same journey down the hill not long ago, and while it was still dark, had he had to lean heavily on the arm of his guide, or had he managed to to go mounted on his mare, perhaps with a monk holding steady of the bridle. Show this boy down to the cooper's cottage, and take care no one sees you down leave the monastery. Such, according to the young, boy, young monk, had been Father Jonas's instruction to him. So Edwin would soon be re reunited with the warrior, but what sort of welcome could he expect? He had let Winston down at the first challenge. Instead of hurrying to his side at the first sign of battle, Edwin had run off into the long tunnel, but his mother had not been down there, and only when the tunnel's end had finally appeared, distant and moonlike in the blackness, had he felt lifting from him the heavy clouds of dream and realized with horror what had occurred. At least, he had done his, at his utmost once he had emerged into the chilly morning, morning air. He had run almost the whole way back up to the monastery, show, slowing only for the steeper slope, sometimes, sometimes pushing through the woods he had felt himself lost, but then the trees had thinned and the monastery had appeared against the pale, scra pale sky, so he had gone on climbing and, and arrived at the big gate, breathless and with his legs aching. The small door beside the main gate was unlocked, and he had managed to collect himself sufficiently to enter the grounds with, ste with stealthy care. He had been aware of smoke for the latter part of his climb, but now it tickled his chest, making it hard not to cough loudly. He knew then for sure that it was too late to move the hay wagon, and felt a great emptiness opening within him. But he had pushed the feeling aside for another moment and pressed on into the grounds. For some time he came across he came across neither monk nor soldier, but but as he moved along the high walls, ducking his head so not as to be spotted from some far off window, he had seen below the soldiers' horses crowded together in the small yard inside the main gate, bound on all sides by the high walls. The animals, still saddled, were circling nervously, even though there were scarce there was scarcely space to do so without colliding. Then, as he came towards the monk's quarters where another of his age might have rushed onto the central courtyard, had had the presence of mind to recall the, ge the geography of the grounds and proceed, and proceed by a roundabout route, utilizing what he remembered of the old ways, even on reaching his destination, he had placed himself behind a stone pillar Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Even on reaching his destination, he had placed himself behind a stone pillar and peered round cautiously. The central courtyard was barely recognizable. Three rope figures were sweeping wearily, and he, as he watched, a fourth arrived with a pail and tossed water across the cobblers, setting to the flight several looking crows. The ground was strewn in places with, with straw and sand, and his eyes were drawn with the several shapes covered over the sackcloth, which he supposed to be corpses. The old stone tower where he knew Winston had held out loomed over the scene, but this too had, had changed. It was charred and blackened in many places, especially around its arc entryway and at each of its narrow windows. To Edwin's eyes, the tower was a whole, was a was as a whole appeared to be sh to have shrunk. He had been craning his neck around the pillar to ascertain if the pools around the covered shapes were of blood or of water. When the bony hands had grabbed his shoulders from behind, he had twisted around to find. Father Ninian, the silent monk staring into his eyes, Edwin had not cried out, but had said in a low voice, pointing towards the bodies, Master Winston, my Saxon brother, does he lie there? The, the silent monk appeared to understand, and shook his head empathetically, 
but even as he raised his a finger to his lips in a familiar manner, he had stared warningly into Edwin's face. Then, glancing furtively around him, Ninian had rugged, had tucked Edwin away from the courtyard. Can we be certain, warrior? He had asked Winston the day before. The soldiers will really come. Who will tell them we are here? Surely the monks believe us but simple shepherds? Who knows, boy? Perhaps we'll be left in peace, but there's one I fancy may betray our presence here. And even now, the good Brennan's may be issuing his order. Test it well, young comrade. Britons have a way of dividing a bill from within from within with wooden slats. We needed pure hay all the way down. He and Winston had been in a barn behind the old tower, having Having the moment done with wood cutting, the warrior had been seized by the urge to load the rickety wagon high with the hay stored at the back of the shed. As they set as they had set about this task, Edwin had been required at regular intervals to clamber up onto the bales and prod into them with a the stick. The warrior observing them observing carefully from the from the ground would sometimes make him go over a section again and order him to thrust a leg as far down as possible into a particular spot. This holy man was just the sort to get absent-minded, Winston had said by the way of explanation. They may have left a spade or pitchfork in the hay. If so, it would be service to retrieve, from, to retrieve it for them, the tools being scars up here, though at that point the warrior had given no hint as to the purpose of the hay. Edwin had known straight away it had to do with confrontations ahead, and that was why, as the bales had piled up, he had asked his questions about the soldiers. Who will betray us, warrior? The monks didn't suspect us. They are so concerned with their holy quarrels, they hardly glance our way. Maybe so, boy, but Tess is there too, just there. Can it be warrior? It's the old couple who will betray us. Surely they are too foolish and honest. They may be Britons, but I don't fear their treachery. Yet, you would be wrong to suppose them foolish, boy. Master Axel, for one, is a deep fellow. Warrior, why do we travel with them? They slow us at every turn. They slow us right enough, but we'll part way soon. Yet, this morning, as we set off, I felt eager for Master Axel's company. As I may wish for one more just of it yet. As I say, he's a deep one. He and I may have a little more to discuss, but just now, let's concentrate on what faces us here. We must load this wagon in sure and steady way, and we need pure hay. No wood or iron there. See how I deepen you, boy. And But Edwin had let him down. How could he have gone on sleeping for so long? It had been a great mystic to lie down at all. He should simply have sat up straight in the corner, napping a few wings in the way that he had seen Winston do, ready at the first noise to start to his feet. Instead, like an infant, he had accepted from the old woman a cup of milk and fallen into deep sleep in the corner of the chamber. Had his real mother called him in his dreams? Perhaps that was why he, he had remained asleep for so long. And why, when he had been shaken awake by the crippled monk instead of rushing to the warrior's side. He had followed after others down the long strange tunnel for all the world as if he were still in the long de depths of dreaming. It had been his mother's voice without doubt, the same voice that had called to him in the barn. Find strength for me, Edwin. Find strength and come rescue me. Come rescue me. Come rescue me. There had been an urgency that he had not heard the previous morning, and there had been more as he stood at the open trap door, staring down at the steps leading into the darkness. He had felt something pull at him with such a force that he had become giddy, almost sick. The young monk was holding back the black thorn with a stick, waiting for Edwin to go ahead of him. Now at last he spoke, though in hushed voice, a shortcut. We'll soon, we'll soon see the roof of the Cooper's cottage. As they come out of the woods, 
to where the land swept down into the receding mist, Edwin could still hear the movement and hissing in the nearby brackens, and he thought of the sunny evening towards the end of the summer when he had talk- talked with the girl. He had not at first seen the pond that day, for it had been small and well hidden by, rush- by rushes. A cloud of brightly colored insects had flown up before him, an event normally to draw his attention, but on this occasion he had been too preoccupied by the noise coming from the water's edge. An animal in a trap, there it, there it was again, behind the bird song, the wind, the noise followed with the pattern, an intense bursting of rustling, as of struggle, then silence, then soon more rustling, Approaching cautiously, he had heard labored breathing. Then the girl had been before him. She was laying on her back in the rough grass, her torso twisted to one side. She was a few years older than him, fifteen or sixteen, and her eyes were fixed fixed on him without fear. It took a while to realize her odd posture had to do with her hands being tied under her body. The flattened grass around her marked her marked the area where, by pushing with her legs, she had been sliding about in struggle. Her cloth smock, tied at the waist, was discol- discolored, perhaps soaked all along one side, and both her legs, unusually dark skin, bore fresh scratches from the thistles. It occurred to him that she was an apparition or a sprite, but when she spoke, her voice had no echo to it. What do you want? What have you? Why have you come? Recovering himself, Edwin said, "If you like, I could re- I could help you. These knots aren't difficult. They just tied me more. They just tied me more tightly than usual. Only now did he notice her face and neck were covered in perspiration. Even as she spoke, her hands under her back were busily struggling. Are you hurt? He asked. Not hurt, but a beetle landed on my knee just now." It clung on and bit me. There'll be sl- swelling now. I can see that you are still too much of a child to help me. It doesn't matter. I'll manage myself. Her gaze remained fixed on him, even as her face tightened and, twi- and she twisted and raised her torso a little off the ground. He watched, transfixed, expecting at any moment to see the hand come out and from under her, but she sat down, defeated, and lay in the grass, breathing hard and staring angrily at him. I could help, Edwin said. I'm good with knots. You're just a child. I'm not. I'm nearly twelve. They'll come back soon, and if they find you untied me, they'll beat you. Are they grown-ups? They think they are, but they're just boys. Older than you, though. There are three of them. They would like nothing better than to beat you. They'll force your head into the muddy water until you pass out. I've watched them do it before. Are they from the village? The village? She looked at him with contempt. Your village? We pass village after village every day. What do we care about your village? They may come back soon. Then you'll be in trouble. I'm not afraid. I could free you if you like. I always free myself. She's twisting again. Why did they tie you? Why? I suppose so that they they could watch. Watch me try to get free. But they are gone now to steal food. Then she said... I thought you villagers worked all day. Why does your mother let you wander? I'm allowed when I finish three corners by myself already today. Then he added, My real mother is not in the village anymore. Where's she gone? I don't know. She's taken. I live with my aunt now. When I was a child like you, she said, I live in a village. Now I travel. Who do you travel with? Oh, with them. We passed this way quite often. I remember them tying me and leaving me here once before this very spot last spring. I will release you, he said suddenly. And if they come back, I won't be frightened of them. Yet something still held him back. He had ex- expected her eyes to shift away, or her body at least to accommodate the prospect of his approach. But she had gone on staring at him while under her arc back. Her, her hands continued her, their struggle. Only when she let out a long, sli- a long sigh did he realize she had been holding her breath for a long time. I can usually do it, she said. If you weren't here, I would have done it by now. 
Do they tie you to stop you from running away? Run away? Where would I run away? I travel with them. Then she said, Why did you come to me? Why don't you go help your mother instead? My mother? He was genuinely surprised. Why should my mother want me to help her? You said that she was taken, didn't you? Yes, that was a long time ago. She's happy now. How can she be happy? Don't you think she wants someone to come and help her? She's just traveling. She wouldn't want me to. She didn't want you to come before because you are a child. But you're nearly a man now. She fell silent, arcing her back as she made another concerted effort. Then she sat back down again. Sometimes, she said, if they come back and I haven't gotten myself free, they don't untie me. They watch and don't and don't say a word until I manage my, by myself and my hands become loose. Until then, they just sit there watching and watching. The devil's horn growing between their legs. I'm, I would mind it less if they spoke, but they stare and stare and don't say anything. Then she said, When I saw you, I thought you would do the same. I thought you would sit and stare and not say a thing. Shall I untie you? I'm not afraid of them, and I'm good with knots. You're only a child. Suddenly, tears appeared. It happened so quickly, and because her face showed no other emotions, Edwin thought at first he was watching perspiration, but then he realized that they were tears, and because her face was half upturned and tears rolled oddly past the bridge of her nose and down the opposite cheek, all the while she, she held her gaze on him. Tears confused him, making him stop in his tracks. Come on then, she said, and for the first time, moved onto her side, letting her gaze fall away towards the bulrushes in the water. Edwin hurried forward like a thief, spying on an opportunity and crouching in the grass, began to tuck at the knots. The twine was thin and coarse, cutting cruelly into her wrist. The palms, in contrast, spread open one across the other, one small and tender. At first, the knots did not yield, but he forced himself to be calm and studied carefully the path the coils took. Then, when he tried again, a knot gave under his touch. Now he went about his work more confidently, glancing from time to time at the soft palm, waiting like a pair of docile creatures. After he pulled the twine from her, she turned and sat facing at what suddenly felt like an uncomfortable close distance. She did not, he noticed, smell of stale excrement the way the people did. Her odour was like that of fire made from damp wood. If they come, she said quietly, they'll drag you through the reeds and then half drown you. You better go. Go back to your village. She reached out a hand experimentally and as, as though unsure if, if even now it was under her, her control and pushed his chest. Go! Hurry! I'm not afraid of them. You are not afraid but they'll still do these things to you. You help me and you have to go away now. Go! Hurry! When he returned just before sunset, the grass was still flattened where he had, she had lain, but there was no other trace left of her. All the same, the spot felt almost uncannily tranquil, and he had sat down in the grass for some moments watching the bulrushes waving in the wind. He never told anyone about this girl, not his aunt, not who would quickly have concluded that she was a demon, nor any of the other boys. But in the weeks that followed, a vivid image of her had returned to him unbidden, sometimes at night within his dreams, often in broad, li broad daylight, as he was digging the ground or helping the man a roof, then the devil's horn would grow between his legs, even though eventually the horn would go away, leaving him with a feeling of shame, and then the girl's words would return to him, Why did you come to me? Why didn't you go and help your mother instead? But how could he go to his mother? The girl herself had said that he was only a child, but then again, she also pointed out that he would be a, he would soon be a man. Whenever he recalled those words, he would feel his shame anew, and yet he had been able to see no way forward. But that all had changed the moment Winston thrown open the barn door, forcing in the dazzling light, and declared that he it was he, Edwin, who had been chosen for the mission. And now here they are, Edwin and the warrior, 
traveling across the country, surely it would be not it would be long till they came upon her, and the man traveling with her would tremble. But had it really been her voice that had led him away? Had it not been sheer terror of the soldiers? Such questions drifted into his mind as he followed the young monks down a barely trodden path beside a descending stream. Was he sure that he had not simply panicked when he had been awoken and seen from the tower, seen from the window, the soldiers running about the old, about the whole, the old tower? But now, when he considered it all carefully, he was certain he felt no fear. And earlier during the day, when the warrior had led him into the same tower that and they had talked, Edwin felt had felt only an impatience to stand at Winston's side in the face of the oncoming enemy. Winston had been preoccupied with the old tower from the time they had first arrived at the monastery. Edwin could remember him continually glancing up and up at it while they had been cutting logs in the woodshed. And when they had pushed the barrels from the ground to deliver the firewood, they had twice made diversions just to go past it. So it had come as no surprise as the monks had disappeared into the meeting and courtyard was empty. The warrior should lean the axe on the wood pile and say, Come, uh, come a moment, young comrade, and we'll examine more closely this tall ancient an ancient friend who stares down at us. It seems to me he watches where we go and takes offense. We have yet to pay him a visit. As they as they had entered under the low arc into the chilly dimness of the towers towers interior, the warrior had said to him, "Take care. You think you are inside, but look at your feet." Glancing down, Edwin had seen in front of him a kind of moat which followed a circular wall all the way to form a ring. It was too wide for a man to leap, and the simple bridge of two planks was the only way to reach the central floor of the trodden earth. As, she, as he stepped in onto the planks, gazing down into the darkness below, he had heard the warrior say behind him, Notice there's no water there, young comrade. Even if you fell right in, I would say you will find it no deeper than your own height. Curious? Don't you think? Why a moat in on the inside? Why a moat at all for a small tower like this? What good can it do? Winston came over the planks himself and tested on his heels the central floor. Perhaps, he went on, the ancients built this tower to slaughter animals. Perhaps, once this was... A this once this was their killing floor what they didn't wish to keep of an animal they, sh they simply push over to the side into the moat what do you think boy that's possible warrior Edwin said yet it would have been no easy thing to lead a beast across this, this narrow plank like that perhaps in the olden times there were a better bridge here Winston said sturdy enough to bear an ox or a bull once the beast had been led over and it guessed its fate, or when the first blow failed to make it sink to its knees, this arrangement ensured it could not be could not easily flee. Imagine the animal twisting and trying to charge, yet finding the moat whenever it turned, and the small, and the one small bridge so hard to locate in frenzy. It's no foolish notion that this was once a place of slaughter. Tell me, boy. What do you find when you look up, Edwin? Seeing the circle of sky high above, said, It's open at the top, warrior, like a chimney. You say something interesting there. Let's hear it again. It's like a chimney, warrior. What do you make of it? If the ancients used this place for their slaughter, warrior, they would have been able to build the fire just where we, sta we now stand. They could have jointed the animal, roasted the meat, and the smoke escaping up to the sky. It is likely, boy, just, just as you say. I wonder if these Christian monks have any inklings of what went on here once. These gentlemen, I fancy, come inside this tower for its quiet and seclusion. See how thick it is circling the wall. Circling wall. Hardly a sound comes through it. Though the crows here, the crows were shrieking as we entered and the way the light comes down from high up. 
It must remind them of their God's grace. What do you say, boy? The gentleman might come in here and pray. Right enough, warrior. Though the ground is too soil, too soiled to kneel the, to kneel on. Perhaps this pray standing, guessing little how this was a pl this was once a place of slaughter and burning. What else do you s do you see looking up, boy? Nothing, sir. Nothing. Only the steps, warrior. Ah, the steps. Tell me about the steps. They first rise over the moat, then circle and circle, bending with the roundness of the wall. They rise until they reach to the sky, at the top. That's well observed. Now listen carefully. Winston stepped closer and lowered his voice. This place. Not just this old tower, but this entire place of all what men of the what men today call this monastery. I would wager was once a hillfort built by our Saxon forefathers in times of war. So it contains many cunning traps to welcome invading Britons. The warrior moved away and slowly paced the perimeter of the floor, staring down at the moat. Eventually, he looked up and said, Imagine this place a fort, boy. The siege broken after many days, the enemy pouring in, fighting in every yard. On every wall, now picture this, two of our Saxon cousins out there in the yard hold back a large body of Britons. They fight bravely, but the enemy is too great in number and our heroes must retreat. Let's suppose they retreat in here, into this very tower, they skip across the little bridge and turn to face the, the, their foes at this very spot. The Britons grow confident. They have our cousins cornered. They press in with their swords and axes, hurry over the bridge over the, our heroes. Our brave kin bring down the first of them, but soon must retreat further. Look there, boy. They retreat up those winding stairs along the wall. Still, more Britons cross the moat until the space where we stand is filled. Yet, the Britons' greater number can't be turned into advantage. For our, for our brave cousins, fight two abreast on, on the stairs, and the invaders can, can but meet them two against two. Our, our, our heroes are skilled, and though they retreat higher and higher, the invaders cannot overwhelm them. As Britain fall, those following take their, take their place, then fall into the in their turn. But surely our cousins grow weary. Higher and higher they retreat as the invaders pursue them stair by stair. But what's this? What's this, Edwin? Do our kin finally lose their nerve? They turn and run. The remaining circles of steps only now, then striking behind them. This is surely the end. The Britons are triumphant. Those watching from down here smile like hungry men before a banquet. But look carefully, boy. What do you see? What do you see as, as our Saxon cousins near the halo of the sky above? Grasping Edwin's shoulders, Winston repositioned him, pointing up to the opening. Speak, boy. What do you see? Our cousins spring a trap, sir. They retreat upward only to draw in the Britons as ants to a honey pot. Well said, lad. And how's the trap made? Edwin considered for a moment, then said, Just before the stairway reaches the, its highest point, warrior, I can see what looks from here to be an alcove, or is it a doorway? Good. What do you suppose hide there? Can it be dozens of our, of our greatest warriors? Then together with our two cousins, they fight their way down again until they cut into the ranks of the Britons here be below. Think again, boy. A fierce bear, then. Warrior. Or a lion. When did you last meet a lion, boy? Fire, warrior. There's fire be behind that alcove. Well said, boy. We can't know for sure what happened so long ago, yet. I would wager that's what await waited up here in that little alcove. I hardly glimpse from down down here there was a torch or maybe two or three blazing behind the wall. Tell me the rest, boy. 
Our cousins throw torches down. What? Onto the heads of the enemy? No, warrior. Down the moat. The moat with fire with water? No wa no warrior. The moats are filled with firewood. Just like the firewood we sweat to cut. Just so boy. And we'll cut more yet before the moon's high. And we'll find ourselves plenty of dry, dry hay too. A chimney, you say, boy. You're right. It's a chimney we stand in now. Our forefathers built it for just a purpose. For such a for just such a purpose. Why else a tower when a man looking from the top has no better view than one at the wall outside? But imagine, boy, a torch dropping into this so-called moat, then another we circled this place earlier. I saw it I saw it at I saw at its back, close to the ground, opening to the zone. That means a strong wind from the east, such as we have tonight, will fan the flames ever higher and how the Britons to escape the inferno a solid wall around them only a single narrow bridge to freedom and the moat itself ablaze but let's leave this place boy it may be this ancient gr tower grows displeased we should guess so many of its secrets Winston turned towards the planks but Edwin was still gazing up at, at the top of the tower but warrior he said our two brave cousins, must they blur in, burn in flames with their foes? If they did, wouldn't it be a glorious bargain? Yet, perhaps it need not come to that. Perhaps our two cousins, even as the scalding heat rises, raised to the rim of the opening and leaped from the top. Would they do, would they do that, boy? Even though they lack wings? They have no wings, Edwin said, but their comrades... We have brought a wagon behind the tower, a wagon loaded with loaded with loaded deep with hay. It's possible, boy. Who knows what went on here in ancient days? Now let's finish with our daydreaming and cut a little bit more wood. For sure this monks face many chilly nights yet before the summer comes. In the battle, there was no time for elaborate exchanges of information. A swift look, a wave of hand, a bark word over, over the noise. That was true. That was all true warriors needed to convey their wishes to one another. It had been in such a spirit, Winston had made his thoughts clear that afternoon in the tower and Edwin had let him down utterly. But had the warrior expected too much? Even old Stepha had only talked of Edwin, Edwin's great promise and what he would become once he had been taught the warrior's ways. Winston had yet to finish training, so how was Edwin to respond with such understanding? And now it seems the warrior was wounded and surely this could not be Edwin's fault alone. The young monk had paused by the edge of the stream to unfasten his shoes. This is where we fought, he said. The bridge is much further down and the land's too open. We may be seen from even the next hilltop. Then pointing to Edwin's shoes, he said, Those looks carefully crafted. Did you make that yourself? Master Baldwin made them for me. The most skilled shoemaker in the village, even though he has fits every full moon. Off with them, soaking a soaking shirt to wreck them. Can you see the stepping stones? Lower your head more and try to gaze beneath the water surface. There, you see them? That's, that's our pathway. Keep them in your sight and you stay dry. Again, the young monk's tone had something curt about it. Could it be that since they had set off, he had had time to piece together in his mind Edwin's role in what had occurred? At the start of the journey, the young monk had not only been war warmer in manner, But he had hardly been able to stop talking. They had met in the chilly corridor outside Father Jonas's cell, where Edwin had been waiting while several voices, lowered but passionate, argued within. The dread of what he might soon be told had mounted. That Edwin had been relieved when, instead of being summoned inside, he had seen the young monks emerge and a cheerful smile on his face. 
I've been chosen to be your guide, he had said triumphantly in Edwin's language. Father Jonas says that we are to go at once and slip out unseen. Be brave, young cousin. You'll be at your brother's side not before long. The young monk had an odd way of walking, clutching himself tightly like someone intensely cold, both arms lost within within his robes, so that Edwin following him down the mountain path had wondered at first, at first if he was one of those born with missing limbs. But as soon as the monastery was safely behind them, the young monk had fallen a step beha- beside him, and producing long, thin long arms had placed it support, supportive, supportively around Edwin's shoulders. It was foolish of you to come back as you did, and after you had made good your escape, Father Jonas was angry to hear of it. But here you are safely again, and with luck no one's the wiser about your return. But what an affair is this? Is your brother always so quarrelsome? Or is it one of the soldiers made, made some fierce insult to him in passing? Perhaps once you reach his bedside, young cousin, you'll ask him how it all began. For none of us can make head of or tail of it. If he was the one who insulted the, so- the soldiers, then it must have been something strong in- instead, indeed. For, s- for they, as one, forgot whatever purpose brought them to the abbot and turning them into wild men, set about trying to a- extract payment for his bonus. I, I myself woke at the sound of the shouting, even though my own chamber was far from the courtyard. I ran there in alarm, only to stand helplessness, uh, helpless alongside my fellow monks, watching in horror all that unfolded. Your brother, they soon told me, had run into the ancient tower to escape the wrath of the soldiers, and though they rushed in after him with mine to tear him, a limb, tear him limb from limb, it seemed that he began to fight them as best as he knew, and, surprising, and, a, and a surprising match he seemed to be, even though... There were thirty or, or more, and he was just one Saxon shepherd. We watched, expecting any moment to see his bloody remains be brought out, and instead, soldier after soldier running from the tower in panic and staggering out, carrying wounded comrades. We could hardly believe our eyes. We were praying for the quarrels to end soon, and for whatever original insults and such violence surely uncalled for. Yet it went on and on. And then, young cousin, the dreadful accident happened. Who knows it wasn't God himself frowning on, on so black a quarrel within his holy building, pointed a finger and struck them with fire. More likely, it was one of the soldiers running back and forth with torches t- tripped and made his great error. The horror of it! Suddenly the tower was ablaze, and who would think an old damp tower could offer so much ki- kindling? Yet a blaze it did, and Lord Brennan's men, together with your brother, caught within. They had done so better for getting their quarrel at once, running out as soon as as fast as they could. And I fancy they thought instead to fight the flame, and saw only too late the fire engulfing them, an accident of true ghastliness, and a few, and the few of them who came out did so just to die twisting horribly on the ground. Yet. Miracle of miracles, young cousin, your brother turns out escaped. Y- Father Ninian found him wandering in the darkness in the ground, dazed and wounded, but still alive. Even as the rest of us watched the blazing tower and prayed for the trapped man inside, your brother leaves, but fr- Father Jonas, who himself treated his wound, has consulted has counseled the rest of the few of us who know this news to keep it a solemn secret even from the abbot himself for he fears if news gets further lord brenners will send out more soldiers seeking vengeance not caring that most died by accident and not by your brother's hand you do well not to whisper a word to anyone at least not until you are both far from this country Father Jonas was very angry you should risk yourself returning to the monastery, yet he con- he's contented he can he can the more easily reunite you with your brother. They must travel the con- together out of this country, he said. The best of men is Father Jonas, and still our wisest, even after what the birds had done to him. I dare say your brother owes him and Father Ninian his life, but that had been earlier. 
Now the young monk had become distant, and his arms were once again tucked firmly within his robe, as Edwin followed him across the stream, trying his best to see the rocks beneath swiftly running water. The thought came to him that he should make a clean breast of it to the warrior, tell him about his mother and how he had called to him. If he had if he explained it all from the start honestly and frankly, it was possible Winston would understand and give him another chance. A shoe in each hand, Edwin sprang lightly towards the next rock, faintly cheered by this possibility. And that we have finished part two. Uh, Giant. And that's where I'm going to end today. Uh, despite my earlier, despite what I said earlier, because I think this is a good pace. This is about three hours long reading, so I think it's this is this is good enough. If I continue any further, it will be like four or five hours, which is not great. <laughs> but thank you. <coughs> Uh, is uh, that Ray? Sorry, I'm sorry. Is that Ray? That sorry, that Ray, that Ray. O zero one, that Ray, that Ray. O zero one. Are you still here? Uh, if not, I'm just going to randomly pick a love and quote. I think they may have left. I apologize for that. So okay, so someone on my chat uh, requested a quote on love, which I do have here. Uh, it's a book from Paolo Coelho, the uh, the author of The Alchemist. So it's just a selected uh, quotations on love by him. I'll just since I'm, since. Dark Ray 009 Redeem it, I'm gonna pick one at random Okay This is what I'm going to read Okay, for the redemption on Read a quote on love This is a quote from The Witch of Portobello By Paolo Coelho Anyone who falls in love without taking into account the common good will be condemned to live in constant fear of hurting his partner, of irritating his new love, of losing everything he built. This is the quote. I repeat. This is the quote on love by, Ca by Paolo Coelho in his book the Witch of Portobello. Anyone who falls in love without taking into account the common good will be condemned to live in constant fear of hurting his partner, of irritating his new love, of losing everything he built. And that is the court on love. That is all for today, ladies and gentlemen. That was part two of uh, the Buried Giant. Ta da! And that was, uh, I think that was a pretty good reading session. I'm not saying that I'm good, but that was a good pace of reading session that doesn't take me five hours to finish reading it i don't know why part one was so long but i guess i feel like part one could have been like separated into two parts but what do i know right what do i know anyway <coughs> thank you so much for everyone 
for coming in today. Thank you to Piao. Thank you to King Komodo. Thank you for the end to the end for moderation and also um, uh, party finder. Uh, thank you to various. Thank you to Ari, Ari Abigail for being here. Uh, thank you to Illurin Fenia in game for dropping by. Thank you to Mary Moki for dropping by. Thank, of course, thank you. To, uh, thank you to Crimson Atalanta for dropping by in game. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for. Thank you for uh, joining my reading session today. I truly appreciate it. Thank you so much. Uh, VODs will be on both Twitch and YouTube for those who missed the reading session. But yes, thank you so much. I'll see you guys soon or next week. I won't be reading anymore this week. Uh, next reading will be next week. Okay, I'll see you then. Thank you so much for joining in today. Bye bye. I'll send you off with my favorite song. Have you ever had a dream that 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 you you would you can do you can do you can you want to do you can ah so great. Thank you. I'll see you guys soon. Bye.